led by its president, the municipal demarcation board led by the chairperson and the CRL Rights Commission led by uh, the chairperson as well. Let me welcome you members and any other guests that we might have. Uh, can I ask for apologies, uh, uh, Portfolio Committee Secretary? Good morning, everybody. These apologies from Honorable Direko that's on study leave. Apology from Honorable Kavan Chaba. She's on sick leave. There's an apology from the minister and the deputy ministers. They are attending the cabinet meeting starting at 8.30. And then also the DGs in the meeting, but um, wanted to request early departure from the meeting. Thank you, Chairperson. Yes, any other apologies? Chair? Chairperson? Uh, I hear the, yes, uh, Honorable, uh, Honorable Kalipi. Chair, at 10, I will quickly go to the Chiefs Forum and then I will come and rejoin you. Okay. Honorable Kronewald. Thank you, Chairperson. Chairperson, yes, unfortunately, I've got another meeting as well and be leaving just after 10. Okay, all those noted. Uh, by the way, do we form quorum, uh, Portfolio Committee Secretary? Apologies, Chairperson. Yes, we do form a quorum for the meeting. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much. Uh, today's agenda is briefing on the third quarter performance by Salga, Municipal Demarcation Board, and CRL Rights Commission. And uh, I think we'll take presentations and uh, after presentations, then there will be engagements. Can I uh, welcome you, President of Salga, uh, Mr. Stofile, and uh, hand over to you. Um, thank you very much, uh, Chair, and, uh, and greetings to uh, the Portfolio Committee Leadership and uh, uh, CRL and the uh, Demarcation Board Leadership, uh, uh, the Deputy President of Salka, that is Flora, that is here. Uh, I, I, won't, I won't be long um, because I want to save more time on the presentation. Um, I understand that we are asked to make a presentation on the quarter performance of the association and then I understand that as far as we have made our own assessment, we have achieved over 80% of what is what we have targeted. And we believe towards the end of this month, we'll be recording uh, almost 100%. But the details, and I will take questions and discussions at a later stage. And I will ask with your permission, uh, Lux, to, to walk us through on our presentation. Thank you very much, Chair. Thank you. Oh, good, good, well, good, greetings to yourself, uh, Honorable Chairperson, as well as all of the members of the of the Portfolio Committee, the the, the leadership of uh, uh, Salga, the MDP, uh, as well as the uh, uh, was it the legal legal rights committee commission. Um, as well as uh, uh, the Salka management team that is also present today, Jefferson. I'm, I'm aware that we have limited time, but what we have done for the benefit of the committee, the Honorable Chairperson, is to give you the detailed presentation. And uh, with the time allocated, we will just highlight key aspects of the presentation um, and, and we would welcome engagements um, on it. Um, I'll, I'll skip many of the slides and focus on what is core uh, to this report. 
th this slide is a useful slide for the committee to get a high level sense of how we have broken down the 55 targets for the year across the six uh, strategic plan outcomes, firstly. Secondly, across the five or six mandates of SALGA as defined by the SALGA membership uh, through the SALGA constitution. The five programs that we have, so we direct our support to municipalities through five programs. They are listed at the bottom left of the slide. And then internally within the organization, how we have spread those particular targets across the different business units that we have, we call them clusters. Um, so this is a high level sense of where our focus is going to as an organization, as we are directing our support uh, and executing our members, uh, and direct, uh, executing our mandate to our, to our members. As the president of Salga has indicated, uh, as at the end of December, uh, we are sitting at 80% achievement to date. Of course, uh, Chairperson, we should explain that many of the targets that we have, they spread across the financial year, meaning that for every quarter, we would then uh, um, identify activities, pre-identify activities, and we will execute those activities accordingly, ultimately contributing towards the overall achievement of the target. Uh, so when you see 80% on track, it means that the activities that we have defined, predefined uh, for execution by the end of December, 80% of those have been done, but there is 20% that remains outstanding. So of the 55 targets, um, 44 targets are well on track to be achieved. And the 20%, meaning 11 targets, are targets that are lagging behind. And later in the presentation, we detail for the benefit of the committee why those particular 11 targets are lagging behind. But we are quite confident that as we are uh, in quarter four, we would be able to move much closer towards the 100% achievement uh, in uh, executing those outstanding uh, um, target. So that's the picture at the end of quarter three, but this one shows, comparatively speaking, Chairperson, as we've been coming to the committee over the quarters, these are the respective uh, uh, progresses that we presented. So in quarter one, we were sitting at 76, quarter two, we were at 75, and now as at the end of quarter, quarter three, we are at 80%. I'm not going to cover these ones, it just breaks down the performance against the mandate of SALGA, against the outcomes, and against the five programs that I had spoken on earlier. Uh, the following few slides, uh, Chairperson highlights what are some of the things we have done in, in the period October, November, December last year, being quarter three, and how municipalities themselves have uh, benefited um, um, from uh, the support that we are directed uh, to them. So we you will see the progress, key highlights on our IGR participation, um, on uh, collaboration uh, with other stakeholders. Collaboration for us is quite critical, um, the Chairperson, because we are operating in a space where there are many other role players and we, we prefer working with others collaboratively to execute our mandate, but also to tap into a better resource entities to assist municipalities. And you can see for the quarter, there are 12 new collaboration partnerships that we have entered into, totaling us now to 44. And, uh, and therefore you can see there are 44 entities, organizations, uh, strategic partners that we collaborate with to direct support to, to municipalities. Um, I will not highlight uh, many of the others uh, um, for the sake of time. Similarly, on the, this slide, on the municipal finance front, on the infrastructure and service delivery front, as well as the socioeconomic development front, you can see the numbers of municipalities that would have benefited from the support they would have directed to them 
on uh, on the, these three core areas: uh, municipal governance, uh, legal support that we provide to municipalities, and then uh, the new kid on the block: digital maturity, directing digital support to our municipalities. Uh, the committee can see there how many municipalities would have, and municipal officials and councillors would have benefited from support that we had directed uh, to them. The, the last one I will hi highlight is on the employment relations, a core mandate of the organization, capacity building initiatives, and then lastly on human capital, capital development. You can see there the support that we had directed uh, without touching on the, on the details uh, themselves. The, the areas that are lagging behind, as I said, um, Chairperson, uh, there are 11 of them. And uh, what the slide shows us is what the output indicator is, the target that we had set for ourselves, and what are some of the reasons that uh, we were not able to execute in quarter three. Let's look at the first one as an example. Um, we had emerged last year uh, in March from, well, from January until March from our provincial and national conferences, which resulted in uh, the amendment of the Salva constitution. And, uh, and, uh, and the NEC was tasked by the conference um, uh, to introduce some of these measures and do further work on these measures. While some work has been done, uh, they have not gone through the governance processes. Uh, but in this quarter, we have already scheduled time for the Committee on Statutory Affairs that has this mandate to process this. So when we come back uh, to present you quarter four, we will certainly present you a picture that shows that um, uh, an updated report on the execution of that deliverable. But much has already been done to achieve that. However, not a, a process through the governance structures and, and the list would go on, uh, Chairperson, um, with the limitation on time, I will not uh, spend time on it. Uh, the same applies on these uh, remaining five, so the six on the previous slide, and uh, these five total the 11 targets that are outstanding, and you can see the varying reasons, which are not really of concern to us. We do believe that it's areas, if not already executed in the first two months of this quarter, we would look at executing it by the end of this month, uh, March, which is the last month of the financial year. Moving on to the financial performance, uh, uh, Chairperson, we remain a financially sustainable organization. Uh, of course, we have many concerns around the continued viability of the organization, and we look at a number of mitigating measures to counter against the risk that we face in the space. And what the slide shows you is that um, from a revenue uh, point of view, we still heavily reliant on municipalities to financially um, fund the organization. And you see 95% of our funds uh, come from municipalities through uh, membership fees that they pay. And we know the biggest risk attached there too is the fact that municipalities have their own cash flow constraints. And uh, sometimes we are the last on the list to be considered um, uh, for payment, not because we don't add value, but Salga does not stop providing services to its members, even though they may not have paid, uh, because we believe that uh, our support to them may assist them uh, to improve their financial standing. And so that remains a concern to us, but a concern that we often try and mitigate against uh, through internal processes and, uh, and systems. Um, this is the picture on the payments of uh, membership levies. You can see some, some provinces are doing very well, whereas some provinces we are, we are struggling to get a membership uh, levies. Um, but it's an, a matter that the leadership of Salga is continu continuously engaging with at both a national and at a provincial level. Um, our spending, we continue to uh, dedicate much of our spend spending towards program costs, uh, meaning the five programs that I referred to uh, earlier. We're directing our, our funding uh, and our resources uh, to, in the main, your, your program cost 
and then we can see um, what balances out as the other cost drivers within the within the organization. Um, this is really just the split internally within the organization. Uh, there's not much to focus on uh, or focus on there. So, so in the in the 15 minutes that was allocated to us, uh, Chairperson, and that's our presentation, and um, um, it's really for noting, uh, but by the committee, but also that we have also submitted our Q3 report to both COCTA and DPME at the end of January, as is required. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much. Um, we uh, have taken notes. Can we then move to um, the demarcation board? Uh, uh, Mr. Tabo Manyoni, Chairperson, welcome. And uh, I'm handing over to you to lead us. And you might as well acknowledge some of your uh, team that might be part of the meeting. Thank you. Thanks very much, uh, Chairperson. Honorable members of the committee, president, deputy president, Mayor Flora, after a long time. Uh, members, let me also acknowledge the officials that are also present uh, in this uh, meeting, Uts Salga, and also from the portfolio committee side. Chairperson, we also, from our side will be indicating that at least we have achieved as per the mandate and also as per the approved performance uh, targets. What I would also want to indicate to this committee is one, at least today, as you would see in the number of participants, we also have the CEO of the MDB board is only having an hour uh, since he came to office. He reported today. So it will be proper that he be welcomed. I'm definitely sure he doesn't even know where exactly is his computer, but I see he's already uh, connected to Percy. So to me, that is another achievement that the institution is now having a newly appointed CEO. To... Sorry, Chair, I, I don't see the presentation from the chair. I yeah, don't know if it's... it's, it's uh, I, I, I assume he's just introducing uh, I'm just the presentation. Oh, yes. OK, because I'm hearing he's talking about successes now. We want to see those successes in people. Oh. <laughs> No, the first yeah. success is the appointment. We still want to see the new, newly <laughs> the new CEO. Okay. The new CEO is one success. Uh, it must be seen. CEO, he probably is having a new computer. He's not even sure how to show his face there. Yeah. But, uh, so, this, so this is not a success, gay. Okay, if a person can show his face. <laughs> So good, problem right there. Good, good, good morning, honorable members. Good morning, good morning everybody. My name is Manyam Rock. Thank you. MDPC. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I chair, uh, uh, chairperson of the committee, the CEO must open his um video. We want to see him. We don't want to speak to spooks or people sleeping at home here. Mm -hmm. Uh, if you don't raise your hand, you throw your mouth. Yes, you are, you are right. Uh, um, I, I think we would want to see him, but uh, he might uh, be struggling, as was indicated. Okay. Um, Honorable Chair, can I make a suggestion? I'll walk over to the chairperson's office, and then you can see me on his video camera. If you give me just two, two, two minutes, one Sorry, 30 seconds, I'll be there. Yeah, so that we can see you. Uh, thanks, Chippers. OK. All, all right. Thanks, uh, Chair and honorable uh, members. Here is the CEO 
Majuzo Tati Space Samlos, you will win. Yes, we can see you. See you. Uh, welcome. And uh, you can pick a sense that the members are keen to work with you. Welcome. And uh, we can see you now. Uh, I'm sure, honorable members, you are, you are comfortable with the picture that you are seeing. Yes, Chair. And it looks young. Of this which is a it's a success. It's a sign of a success. Uh, over to you, Chairperson. Thank you, Chair. Um, thanks, Member um, Chairperson, we also have, because as I as I indicated, um, the poor you was just reported to work today. Um, we will have the COO and also our CFO is here also participating. We'll have the COO to do the presentation. And Dr. Ramagaza, I'm handing over to you. Thank you. Yes, thank, thank you very much, Chairperson. Uh, I've just shared, um, I've just opened the video. I hope I'm visible. Yes, you are visible. Thank you very much to members. The screen, we want now the presentation. Okay. Uh, I hope members can see the presentation now. Yes, we can see. Thank you very much, uh, members and chairperson of uh, the portfolio committee, uh, members of the portfolio committee, uh, president of Saga, and all the colleagues that are in the meeting, and all protocol observed. It's an opportunity once again, members, for the MDB to brief you on its uh, performance to date. Uh, we, we, we take this opportunity very seriously because we really have to make sure that you are abreast of what we are doing over the year so that you don't get uh, to be presented with a failed performance for the year. So we really appreciate the opportunity. As, as, as it was done with Saga, I'll try not to, uh, to, to, I'll try to stick to the time that we've been given. And in that case, because we've got a, a, a detailed presentation, there are areas that I know members are acquainted with. So those I will not sit on them much. And that is the outline of my presentation. And obviously, as I've already said, we are uh, presenting to the portfolio committee our performance to date, both on the uh, uh, financial aspects and all the uh, important aspects of our annual performance plan. This particular slide talks to who we are and how we are. We are as an institution set up. I will not get into the details. This is just a setup that assists us to get to the performance that you I'm going to be presenting on today. Uh, just like the vision and mission, I will not be Hello. Uh, sitting on those. Yes. Yes. I'll continue. Okay. I, okay. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Yes, I will sit on this particular one just to to orientate the members on the overall uh, annual performance plan as it aligned to the strategic to the five year strategic plan. Uh, we've got uh, four outcomes uh, that we have set ourselves in terms of the uh, strategic plan, uh, which is organizational excellence, well defined municipal spaces, improved access to research and spatial information, and improved public and stakeholder participation. Out of those, we've got several indicators, as you can see in that uh, column number two. And uh, for that first one, which, is, which talks more about the organizational excellence, we want to continue to improve as an institution. And uh, in that case, we have put, uh, developed for ourselves a capability maturity model, which after a period of five years, we want to see ourselves at level five. And then with well-defined municipal boundaries, in terms of our strategy, we have already uh, uh, delimited wards, uh, which were used in the previous election. So that one we've already achieved. And in this instance, we are currently uh, uh, working on the municipal boundary termination process. So in terms of the overall strategy, 
we are on track to get to achieve that particular work. The next one is about our research. We have had a number of outputs over the, the, the strategic uh, plan uh, period. And we are in this particular financial, especially the next uh, uh, annual performance plan, we'll have our final uh, outputs that we would want to, 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 to finalize. The same with regards to improved public and stakeholder participation. This is an area that we will continue to make sure that we improve. And, and as you can see, we're on track. So that's overall what we had planned to do. For this particular financial year, as you, you, you know, we've got four programs. Uh, that uh, assist us and those four programs are the ones that we use it's, it's like our vehicle towards the achievement of our targets so with regards to the outcomes in this particular financial year with regards to organizational excellence we had about 13 outputs and indicators which makes about 54 percent of the total and we with regards to uh, well-defined municipal places we had uh, four which is about 17 percent the same for research, and we've got about 30 for the public and stakeholder participation, which makes about 12%, and that makes 24 uh, indicators uh, for and 100% uh, for the for the year. In summary, uh, effectively, uh, with regards to program one, in quarter three we had three targets, and we have uh, achieved all of those. In program two, we had uh, three and we have achieved two, we have not yet achieved one. I'll get to the details uh, as I continue with the presentation to explain why, but we have to indicate that uh, uh, we have already uh, achieved some of the aspects of that. And then with regards to program three, we have had two targets, we've achieved those by quarter three, and program four, we had three which we have achieved. Uh, that's the overall performance. This particular slide is just a representation of what I just spoke about now gra graphically. So I will not repeat uh, what I had just said. Uh, uh, with regards to the specifics, uh, if you want to know the specific uh, work that we were, we are doing with regards to program one, you can see that in quarter three, uh, we had, uh, I won't go through each one of them because these ones are more administrative and, and uh, in nature. Obviously, on a monthly basis, just to make sure that we comply with legislation, we produce and analyze our work and, and, and produce reports in terms of how we are complying with legislation. That has been achieved, even in terms of uh, uh, organizational performance sessions that we have achieved in quarter three. And also with regards to financial management reports, those have been achieved, risk mitigation reports uh, also achieved. With regards to program two, this is where uh, the, the core aspects of the organization sits. We had planned uh, in quarter three that we will publish section 26 notices. That's uh, section 26 uh, of the Municipal Demarcation Act for class two to four boundary determination. Class two to four is the boundary determinations where maybe a particular segment of a community is being moved from one municipality to the other. And, up to the level of a four where we might be having an amalgamation for an, for an example. So we had planned that by quarter three, we will have a notice. A section 26 notice effectively is just a notice that says, as the municipal demarcation board, as members of the public tell us what to think about it, there's an intention to consider, but we have not yet considered. So we couldn't do that. As you can see, you can see the, the reason was that the board in the middle of the year revised the program. Uh, and the program was revised in such a way that uh, uh, some of the work were pushed to the next quarter. But it was mainly because we, we decided to conduct what we call a research on all of these cases. You will know that some of these cases are very uh, uh, important or big enough for us to have enough information. So because there was a delay with regards to the procurement processes and, and uh, uh, for, the, for the people who were supposed to do the research, so those were uh, then could not be conducted on time. And that has had an impact on the program or as a whole. And that is why we couldn't uh, uh, publish those section 26 notices. However, the section 26 notice with regards to this target will be achieved in this quarter. Uh, the reports are already in and the board is meeting in the next two, two, three weeks to finalize those. And immediately after that, we, 
we will be publishing. So we will be able to achieve that particular target. The next one, which is very much aligned, which is very much a continuation of, of that previous one. We, we, you know, no, I'm sorry. These are separate cases. These are class one. Class one is those small boundary changes, which don't, in most cases, there are no people affected. It's just an alignment of a boundary, maybe to a cadastra or to a farm. So these are negligent alignment boundaries, which uh, we had targeted to achieve, uh, to publish a section 21 notice. And that has since been published in December. So we have achieved that particular one. Uh, the next one is uh, uh, public consultations in line with the resolutions of the board for class two to four. This particular target uh, has been uh, as a result of the change to the program of, uh, of the, by the board that has been moved to the next uh, financial year uh, because uh, we are going to be running a very intensive uh, uh, public consultation process Therefore, we didn't want to rush it, as the members would know, and they've encouraged us from time to time that when it comes to public consultations and participation, the board should make sure that it's intensive enough. So that has been moved to quarter one of the next financial year as a result of the change to the program. The next one is the number of voting districts analyzed. This is where we're analyzing voting districts. You remember after the elections, uh, that before the elections would delimit wards and wards are based on voting districts. So because voting districts uh, are used to build wards, therefore it's important that we have a good understanding of voting districts. So we were performing an analysis on voting districts to determine where they split communities so that we can give that feedback to the IEC for them to be able to, to adjust the voting district boundaries so that when we go to the next ward delimitation, we avoid splitting communities. So that has been achieved. And then with regards to, to research reports, that has also been achieved. And also with regards to uh, re study reports prepared for all municipal boundary determinations, that has since been achieved in this particular quarter. So we are on, on track in that regard. We're, and also with regards to public awareness uh, activities that we had identified, that has been achieved and we also had some a bit of additional communication co opportunities that arose and we have utilized uh, those co quite efficiently and as you can see even with the uh, stakeholder awareness activities that we have done we have done what we had planned to do for quarter three and a bit more and also with regards to communication aspects and uh, with this one on communication i must indicate that uh, when we publish those notices that I spoke about uh, for, for, for the uh, category one redeterminations, it was that process was supported by a very intense uh, communication process where we went to radios and newspapers to make sure that we inform people. And the same for the section 21 where we were asking people for objections. That was supported by a, 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 a communication campaign to make sure that people are aware of those particular municipal boundary changes. This particular slide is just summarizing the, the detail that I've just gone through right now. Now I'm going to, uh, to uh, invite the, C, the, the CFO to take the committee through the, our financial management for uh, report for quarter three. Over to you, uh, Ms. Bati. Um, thanks, Alu. Uh, good morning, uh, members. Um, as well as uh, management from both Salga and MD, MDB. Um, I am going to go through the financial management for quarter three, uh, just to give an indication of whether the financial resources that we get are being utilized according to approved plan and to meet strategic objectives as outlined by Alwani. Um, in the period under review, we had a budget of 50 million rand uh, and we spent 50 million. So we had a small variance of around uh, 360,000 negative. And, uh, and the little overspending that's indicated there is mainly due to depression and amortization because these items are accounting line items which are not uh, budgeted for. Uh, the, 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 the 
over a, a, a spending, however, has been offset by a small variance in goods and services, uh, as well as compensation of employees and CAPEX. But uh, those variances are, are very small. Um, so if effectively, we've overspent by 1% um, of our budget, which is negligible. Uh, just to go through those uh, minor uh, uh, variances under goods and services, we've seen uh, 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 savings in stationery, as well as travel and accommodation. Uh, on annual license fees, printing and photocopying, as well as catering. And we also had a small saving under CAPEX of 42,000 rand. I mean, 72,000 rand. So those are small amounts. In terms of uh, spending per, per business unit, uh, finance had uh, 7.5 million and or rather 7.6 million and spent the whole, whole amount except for the 13,000 13, variance which is mainly depression so all all units uh, the, the the underspending or rather the overspending is mainly on depreciation cooperations had 11 million and spent all of it uh, same as research stakeholder and media, as well as uh, corporate services. And in terms of the remaining budget for the year, we still have 38,000 rand to spend in the final quarter. Um, 764 of that is committed. Therefore, we are actually left with the 37% uh, uh, budget to spend. Uh, if we look at mechanical focus, we should be straight line focus. That is, we should be around 25% for the quarter, but we are at the 37 because of um, the, 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 the postponement that Alwani explained into the final quarter. So we still have to spend on a, a, the research uh, that was done for the boundaries as well as the, 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 the publication of notices and the stakeholder uh, um, uh, 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 awareness sessions that need, uh, needs to be held. We, a lot of work has been done in, in January and February in, in, in that regard. So um, hence, we are sitting at 37%. Uh, according to our focus, uh, we should be spending close to 100% uh, of the budget, and whatever will not be spent will be committed um, at the end of the financial year. We will have a small uh, 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 under spending on compensation of employees because of the vacant position of the CEO, which has just been filled now from 1st March. So January and February will have that, uh, less what we were paying as an acting allowance, as well as the corporate, or rather company board secretary, because that position is yet to be filled. Uh, thank you. Thanks, Alu. Back to you. Thank you very much, members. Um, we thought it, it's important that we should also brief the committee on the important work that we have been doing and for that the committee is aware of what we're going to be getting into. It's important that the members of the committee are aware of the actions and the activities of the board on the ground, especially in the next coming few months, which is going to be very critical in this regard. That's with regards to the municipal boundary determination process. As I've said, this particular slide just gives you an overview of why we do municipal boundaries. You can see as it moves, the arrow move goes towards the end, we are targeting the next local government elections. In other words, the board should, should be done with its work before the next local government elections, as you can see. So the process that we are dealing with now, I'm not gonna get into the details, uh, just, to, just to run it through quickly. It starts with the board 
publish uh, receiving uh, proposals for municipal boundary changes or initiating its own. And then the board, before it even starts considering, it publishes the notices that we call Section 26 notices. This is where we just say to the public, this is what we got. Uh, tell us what you think about them. We are intending to possibly consider them. But after considering your input as members of the community, the board will decide whether these are worth taking forward or not. So that's the, the, the Section 26 process. After all of that, then the board will either go to public meetings, formal investigations, and all the like, and determine. But all of these processes are accompanied by a very intense public consultation process. I spoke about earlier about the the nature of the changes that we have. The ones that I said we've already completed are the class ones. These are technical minor boundary adjustments. And also then in, in the next few months, we're gonna be getting into what we call class twos, threes, and fours. These are the bigger changes. Often these may actually result in a lot of, of strife on the ground when people, either those who are happy will be uh, commending the board that it started this way and those who are not happy we may not predict how they are going to react, but that's the process that we're going to be starting, uh, those class one, two, 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 three. And these are the ones that we have been doing research on so that by the time we go out to members of the public and say, we are intending to consider them, we have got some understanding of, of, of all of them uh, ourselves. So where, where is the process? I did speak to the fact that we have started with a class one boundary determinations, which started, uh, uh, in November uh, uh, 2021, when we issued a circular inviting people to make submissions, and that period came to a close. After uh, coming to a close, then we also convened stakeholder education and awareness sessions with all municipalities in 2022. And these sessions, we presented the legal requirements and approved time frames for the municipal boundary determination process. Uh, and in July 2022, we published a Section 26 notice in all uh, affected provinces and municipalities for the class one boundary terminal, those minor ones. So we published a notice that says, we are intending to consider this, please tell us what you think. And we received uh, several uh, uh, submissions. And in September, 2022, the board redetermined. In other words, the board uh, changed boundaries uh, 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 for those minor adjustments, uh, minor alignments and all that and published uh, in provincial gazettes. These gazettes, in essence, were just saying, if you object to the changes or that the board has made, please send us uh, uh, your, your objections within a particular period of time. And that was done. As I said earlier, this was accompanied by a communications process. And after the closing date, the board considered all the objections. And in, in February 2023, we published the final notices which talks to the final adjusted boundaries. So that's for class one boundary determination. This particular slide just shows you that particular process and the breakdown of the number of class one cases per province. Like in the Eastern Cape, we had 25, in Kwasi we had 16, Northwest 11, like that. And, and the section 26 notice, as I've said, uh, we went extensive in terms of newspapers. It's a legal provision that we must published in a newspaper that circulated in the area and that was done. We used several newspapers and after that, we uh, went to section 21 and that's what the board has determined. Out of 82 that the board had published in terms of section 26, only 77 were finalized. Or in other words, only boundaries were changed for 77 uh, uh, class one proposals. And those were subsequently published in the gazette, as you can see the list of gazettes there and uh, uh, finally, after the objection period, with that, the boards then finalized the boundaries. And then you can see out of 24 that were published or boundaries which were changed, 23 were finally uh, confirmed as new boundary changes in, in the Eastern Cape and in, the, in KwaZulu Natal. You can see out of 16, 15 were, were, fi uh, were confirmed. And uh, in Pumalanga, all of those were confirmed. The same for Northwest and the same for Northern Cape. And in the Western Cape, only four out of five were confirmed. In essence, with class one redeterminations that were done were 74 uh, in total. And those at the end there, those are the particular gazettes. If you want to see 
those changes. You can pick up those particular gazettes uh, and see the changes that the board has done. And then coming to the process that we're going to be uh, embarking on with regards to those bigger cases now that I did mention that they sometimes are, are very sensitive on the ground. However, uh, the board had recorded about 221 of them and by 31 March 2022. That was after we have asked members of the public who have proposed us to submit. And thereafter, we analyzed all of them and we conducted, as I said, the research on each one of them, uh, which we're gonna use throughout the, uh, the, the process that we're gonna be looking at them. And during February and March, which is now, the board consider all those particular sub submissions and determine those that have to go to section 26. Uh, section 26, once again, I'll say it's not a determination. And the board, in terms of the law, the board had not determined. What the board will be doing is just to say, we have got these proposals as members of the public. Please tell us what you think about them before we can even consider. So it's very important, uh, uh, this particular point that I'm mentioning, because we've had previously lessons that we've learned that sometimes when these notices which are just an intention are published. Often uh, uh, there's misunderstandings where people will think that these are a determination. That's why we emphasize that we, we, we support these processes through an, an extended effort of public consultations and communication. And that's what we're gonna do to make sure that we communicate as extensively as possible that these are just an intention that the board has not yet uh, con uh, considered but we're just asking for members of the public to give us inputs. Thereafter, with regards to these ones, in April and May, those that the board would decide to consider will then move, will then convene public meetings in areas that are affected. Uh, uh, and thereafter, the board will con convene what we call formal investigation. This is a new process that we are implementing in terms of the law, in terms of Section 29 and 30 of the um, Municipal Demarcation Act. That's a formal investigations will uh, happen in June and, and between June and August 2023. This is where, again, out of the public meetings, out of the research that we've done, out of the Section 26 notices, we'll identify people that we think can give us more information. And those, in terms of the act, we are allowed to summon to come for them to come and ask the questions to the board in terms of the changes that they have proposed or that they are talking about. So this is a process that we are also going to be running between June and August. During September and October, uh, the, the board will consider all those uh, things that I spoke about, public meetings, inputs, research, formal investigations, and decide which ones could then, which boundaries can then be changed. But also the board can also decide not to change the boundaries. That's why in that paragraph 13, it says the board must consider uh, all objections lodged and decide either confirm vary or withdraw. So the board, out of after considering all this information, can decide to either confirm its determination, vary or withdraw. So so that's the process, which gonna which is gonna end in December. And thereafter, all the boundaries that the board would have would be confirming will then be published in terms of the provincial gazette and thereafter will hand over to the independent electoral commission. This particular slide I'm not gonna go through the details you will see the different classes and the different provinces where they sit. And even this particular, is just so we're showing you pictorially in terms of the map, with the red, that's where most of these cases are. And the green, that's where we do not have any, any two to three uh, class cases. Thirdly, uh, this is just a program that we thought we should share with the committee. It's the same thing that I was presenting now, so I'm not going to repeat the particular. And this is just an ex example that we have presented to the committee before in terms of the extent of the, of, the, of the classes that we are dealing with. This particular slide, obviously, we, the committee is now probably tired with us indicating that we, our financial uh, capability is, is very constrained. You can see that through this process, we, we, we suppose to accompany all these processes with intensive public communication and, and participation process. That needs a lot of uh, financial muscle. And, but also, as the MDB, we are intending to, to still do our regionalization. Obviously, that's linked to the financial resources that we have. 
But the one area that I want to highlight, which we have highlighted before, is that for all these 229 cases that I'm talking about, what we picked up is that some of them, at some of those proposals, when people are motivating, we've picked up that it's issues that cannot be addressed by change to, to municipal boundaries. For example, people are complaining about poor municipal service delivery, and obviously that you cannot necessarily address by changing a municipal boundary. Allegiance to tribal or traditional leadership. Some people feel that they are, are they owe more allegiance to a traditional council boundary or tribe, which is in another area, against what is in another area. And some of these things is about the dynamics of relations, interrelationships between the different communities, and we may not be able to address them through a boundary change. And some of it is about party political instability and contestations, where in some instances. You find that because uh, I'm, I belong to a particular party A, I'm in the boundary in another municipality. And I think if I am de if my area is determined in another municipality, I stand a good chance of being voted or being supported. And then people are. No, 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 no. It's beyond now. Okay, thank yeah, you. I, 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 can, I can take that. I'm going to another meeting. Yes, I just, I just told the guy. Okay. Okay. Is, um, I, I I think his mic was on. <laughs> oh. Yeah. So as we conclude, uh, as always, we really appreciate the the the, the support of the Co portfolio committee. As you can see, we're emphasizing a lot of public consultation, and I would uh, I would credit this uh, mainly also to the the. the the essence of the input that we received from this particular committee. Uh, all the time when we are planning, the words that comes out and the guidance that comes from the committee are always with us that please never ever compromise on public consultation and engagement. And that is the area that we're going to continue to improve on. Thank you very much, Chairperson. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I, I thought uh, it's, it's somebody who was now taking over. And we now, uh, I think we have, we have taken notes. Can we now move to the CL Al Rights Commission? Uh, Chairperson, Professor Msuma. Uh, Good morning, oh. Chair. Good morning, Chair. Um, uh, Chair of the Portfolio Committee and the Honorable Members of the Portfolio Committee also acknowledging the president of SALGA, as well as the chairperson of the demarcation board and colleagues uh, from um, our institutions uh, present here. Um, let me introduce to you the team from CRL. We have um, Mr. Maf uh, the, the, the deputy chair, um, Commissioner Petu, Mr. Mafaza, the CEO, Mr. Smarts, uh, the CFO, um, I would like to call upon uh, Mr. Mafaza to present the performance of the CRL Commission on quarter four activities. Thank you so much, Chairperson. Thank you. Well, thank you, Chair. Um, let me first check if you are able to see our presentation, Chair. Not yet. Um, we, we try, I'm not sure. Now is it there? Not yet. Mm. I can't see it. Oh. We actually suspected that we will have this challenge. Okay. Yeah, this thing is Yes, we can see it. Huh? Thank you so much. <clears throat> Chair, uh, good morning, Chairperson, uh, members of the committee, the leadership of SALGA and the Marketing Board, and obviously our leadership uh, as a commission. 
Um, Chairperson, I'm going to <clears throat> uh, save your time. I think uh, uh, demarcation board also ate our minutes uh, and uh, very unusual of uh, the demarcation board. But um, we understand the challenges that they were raising that they wanted to bring to the committee. So I'm going to save time uh, by not uh, talking to the issues that we normally uh, take them as standard. Um, that is slide one to eight. Um, in terms of oh, my movements here, they're not moving the slides. I thought, I thought they would move. Yes, they are now. It's just slow. So I'm not going to waste that time. Um, slide four, but my system is responding very slowly. I don't know what's going on. Uh, five and then six, because those are standard. It's just the impact statements and the outcomes that we usually would report to the uh, committee throughout. So we take it that uh, it is more of um, uh, is there somebody who is uh, helping me with uh, moving the slides? Uh, yes. Move. Oh, yes. Uh, I needed to know that because I can see there's something happening here in the system. So it means it's not me flighting, it's, the, it's Sherin. Okay, Sherin, let's go to, yeah, we'll start it with uh, slide eight. Um, slide eight uh, has to do with the targets of all the departments. As we know, we have um, about five programs and then three core. Um, legal services is one of the core, public engagement and education, research and policy development. And then we have two that are support, that is administrative, administration and communication and marketing uh, and information and technology. So Sharon, you'll have to move with me now because I'm not in control. So, so if uh, uh, nine slide nine. So, if we look uh, chair in the previous slide or eight, our uh, it went it, it actually indicated that we achieved all the targets except uh, the first program, which is uh, program one, uh, the administration, and we'll give the details why. It's just some outstanding uh, uh, audit findings that we are dealing with, uh, but we are hopeful that by the end of this quarter will have actually completed all of them. So this slide nine is just a summary of all the programs and their performance in terms of the percentages that were shown in slide eight. So the overall performance per program for the third quarter, just in a pie uh, chart, just to show that 85.71%. Um, overall achievement of the uh, organization stands at 94.44%. So that is the only program that uh, chair, we are hoping that by the end of this quarter, we will have reached uh, 100% and that will be good for our performance as an organization. Then this slide um, on program one chair, I'm not going to waste your time because I said, this is the program where we achieved 85% and not 100%. So if we look uh, on this one, we'll see that all uh, targets were achieved. Um, then uh, we'll uh, go to the next one again, where again is the same program, where it also shows that uh, in column one we've achieved, but where we did not achieve, and that is negatively impacting the 100%, is column two, where it talks about the queries uh, on internal and external audit findings, wherein we only resolved um, a 96.29% um, in the, courts, in the third quarter, and we have a variance of 3.70%. And the reason meaning that uh, some of the findings are still in progress, but we are very hopeful that in the last quarter now that we are in, in this month, we should be able to close them down. So this, yes, please. Then program uh, three, which is legal, services and conflict resolution. On this one chair, we have achieved all the targets, 100% in the third quarter. So I'm not gonna waste a lot of time, but it is important to indicate that the details of the cases that we dealt with will give examples in the next slide. 
but also with the bills that we have worked on uh, or reviewed as a commission, uh, we'll also give some information in the next slide, including the bylaws. And we are here now, complaints that we have handled in the third quarter. We had actually received 24 cases during this quarter, but uh, 14 of these uh, were on culture, related matters, whereas uh, 10 were on religion. So a total of 17 cases were finalized, nine on culture and eight on religion. The remaining cases, that is five on culture and two on religion, are still in progress, but we have already started the process uh, in terms of our own internal complaints handling manual, uh, in terms of how we deal with the cases. We have sent acknowledgement letters to the complainants already, uh, for the very same seven cases and uh, they are in progress. So we also uh, have dealt with all the legal opinions uh, that uh, the unit were, was given so that we are able to function effectively because sometimes I always say that we do a pause in terms of our work sometimes and get opinions so that we do not falter in our processes. So legal uh, opinions were provided in the third quarter and all of them were given back. So the examples of cases that we handled, again, some cultural cases that we handled, uh, it has to do with allegations of municipality failing to consult with cultural groupings in a sacred land development in Hawick, in Umgeni local municipality, a case of new farm owners in Honeydew, the exhumation of human remains. However, uh, close family members were denied the right to perform rituals before exhumation and reburial. And then one other example of the case, uh, cultural cases, is the complaint regarding a family that seeks to exhume and rebury their son. The matter has been referred to the South African Heritage Resources Agency for further handling as no cultural rights are being violated. And the other one is the uh, complaint by a traditional healer who's denied a cultural right to erect, um, uh, mm -hmm. can't read the other, uh, my screen is closed at the end, but, but yeah, it has to do with a traditional healer who was denied a cultural right to uh, erect something, I can't read the, uh, a shrine. Yes, the, yeah, I will say a shrine or umsamo, but the body corporate of Port View Guidance in Rimse. Body corporate alleges there was no a prior approval granted. I'm just giving these examples, uh, Chair, so that at least members can have an idea of some of the cases that we are dealing with, but they are not exhaustive. We just spotted out or took out some examples for the members. Then when it comes to religious cases, we have examples of a case of hospital management refusing a pastor to pray for a patient uh, in hospital, and then a complaint regarding alleged misconduct, mismanagement of funds within the international assemblies um, or, or of God. And then again, complaint lodged by Hindu religious member to allegations of violation of his religious rights uh, to lighting of fireworks in celebration of, uh, of Diwali. And the last one would be a complaint relating to a child being bumped by the car on a Christian school premises. So these cases do come and they need the attention of the commission to deal with. So when we deal with uh, issues of opinions, it has to do with the General Council of the Bar of South Africa. That's one opinion we wanted. And then uh, um, another opinion was requested on the rape case that must be reported to law enforcement agencies. And then the other one is the dissatisfaction about the meeting that took place on 18 October, 2022 in Problesdal. That is a land claim complaint. So all these cases, they come and we, we deal with them and refer some to the relevant bodies. And when it comes to issues of uh, legislative uh, reviews, in the quarter under review, two bills, uh, which are the registration of Muslim, um, the, the registration of Muslim marriages bill um, and the divorce <coughs> amendment, which also impact the religious rights of Muslim women and children were reviewed. Uh, four bylaws on spatial planning and land use management with focus on land use for religious purposes in Gauteng and KwaZulu Natal provinces were reviewed. The bylaws were reviewed in Rand West, local municipality, Etequini Metropolitan Municipality, Kwadukuza local municipality, and Monday in the local municipality. This is just to give an overview 
chair so that we can see the, some of the footprints that the commission is making in local communities. Then some of the observations we have made uh, when we're dealing with the bylaws, uh, especially on the land use for religious purposes, on reviewing uh, bylaws on spatial and land use management by law, uh, by law focusing on land use of religious purposes in the West Rand and the Chequin, the following we observe that lack of land use scheme in the municipality creates a challenge as there is no specific mention of zoning for religious purposes in the bylaw. And the land use scheme would serve as a simple indicator to tool, I mean, tool of the category of religious land and building. Lack of land use scheme might affect religious communities in the sense that they may erect churches in zones that are not allocated for such purposes. Uh, Sherry. And again, um, some overviews again are in uh, municipalities in Kwadukuza local municipality, the following observations were made that the land use scheme allows for the establishment of places of worship in residentially detached building areas, medium and high density residential areas and agricultural holdings with consent of the municipality. Then there have been complaints about residents in other townships concerning high noise levels caused by churches. <clears throat> Excuse me. It is the responsibility of municipalities to ensure that religious places or churches comply with noise bylaws to avoid inconveniences to other residents. Bylaws on nuisance or noise control in the municipalities will assist in controlling the noise. Um, next slide, please. And then we get to program um, three, which is public engagement and education. If we look at these slides, they were targeting to do eight engagements with communities on cultural, religious, and linguistic rights, but also they wanted to do uh, educational awareness in terms of or campaigns again on cultural rights and uh, uh, community, I mean, uh, religious rights and linguistic rights that were supposed to be conducted. So in all of them, including the updated of the updating of the database of these communities uh, in the third quarter, they were all achieved, Chair. So we'll give examples of the kind of issues that they were dealing with in the next slide. When it comes to awareness campaigns, in the quarter under review, <clears throat> this, um, unit uh, managed to visit uh, the Free State Province and the areas in the Free State Province were Makwad, uh, Klokolan, and Fixbeck. So the unit further conducted awareness campaigns with participants at the Mapungubia Arts Festival that, that was in Limpopo in uh, Pulukwan. So these are some of the areas where they raise awareness in terms of their campaigns on cultural, religious, and language rights. Next slide. And then again, in terms of the other engagements, they also managed to partner with the uh, uh, Land Reform uh, Commission on the review of the witchcraft suppression, uh, which um, we, we were moving with them in different places. And then the engagements took place at Mulechi Traditional Council, attended by the headmen and women from all villages in the area of the jurisdiction of the Traditional Council which was over 130 villages, as well as traditional healers from those villages. That is in Limpopo. And additional engagements were conducted with communities in the following areas. That is Helena, accompanied by some village traditional council members, Sasolbeck, Denny, Dennisville, and Orangeville in the Free State uh, Province, Sidibeng and Everton in the Gauteng Province. These are the provinces we visited uh, in terms of um, the collaboration with the Law Reform uh, Commission. Then when we come to research, it's easy. They were targeting only one report. And in this report, they were trying to you know, interrogate the understanding of communities on what a cultural community is and uh, where, what could be the possible rights in, from their understanding and perception so that you know the commission can be able to gather information on how uh, you know, the, com the communities understand their rights, cultural rights, vis-a-vis -vis the constitution and make some recommendations to assist them. Um, the other slide. Then we come to some of the issues that they concentrated on in the third quarter as research in those projects. Um, they had conducted a number of focus group meetings as part of a methodology of research for data gathering purposes for a research project named Definition of Cultural Community. That's exactly what I was talking to. And these focus group members um, composed of the Sierra Rights Commission, community councils, traditional leadership, religious uh, leaders, 
and cultural communities and cultural experts. Uh, experts. <clears throat> the unit visited the following areas in terms of this work. Sidibeng in the Val in Gauteng province, Silver Crowns in the Northwest, Bad Plus in the Petrotif in Pumalanga. The next slide. Then the highlights of the third quarter for RDP again, um, the resuscitation of diminished heritages. The research unit has embarked on a journey to researching uh, or to research on the understanding of spiritual significance of caves, rivers and mountains, which will then help in terms of giving direction to the relevant departments and authorities on how some uh, diminished heritages can be resuscitated, promoted and protected. This is a, one of the projects that the commission is actually flagging. Uh, we are hoping we will make a very positive impact in terms of how we can uh, then look at some diminished heritage sites and how we can come up with strategies in terms of uh, helping, uh, you know, in resuscitating them, but also as a way of, of creating employment and so on and so forth for those communities. We are hoping um, this will be one of the reports that we will, we will be able to uh, make impact uh, once it is completed. And then we have the program uh, five, which is communication, marketing, and IT. This one, uh, Chair, also achieved all its targets in terms of the uh, quarterly targets. But we'll just give examples of what, what kind of work they were doing. When they say one report on implementation in uh, and the external communication strategy uh, was produced uh, and was achieved, what, what does it entail? So we'll give in the next slide just some few highlights in terms of what this report covers. Next slide, please. Yeah, so we also have, um, so this one report on implemented internal and external communication strategy, obviously it would cover the media statements, the media management, social media support to operational units because when these uh, programs uh, go to different, uh, you know, uh, communities, uh, our media uh, people are, are also accompanying them to make sure that, uh, you know, there's awareness and the, the event is known around uh, to the local communities that we are targeting. And uh, here we find that the unit provided the following interventions, uh, provided support service during workshops, like I've said, on the review of the Witchcraft Suppression Act of 1957 in Limpopo. And then they uh, have also investigated a social media post of uh, a pastor charging people money for prayers, and then participated in the intervention relating to the tragedy that befell 200 young men in a botched circumcision in Palavora, Limpopo, the project that we've just completed in the third quarter, and uh, conducted awareness with communities in Sitsolo municipality in the Free State in collaboration with public engagement and uh, engagement and education uh, department. Uh, then when it comes to media statements, just an example of some of the media statements released in the third quarter, just an alert about the Sierra Nas Commission, a report back session to the parents of the young men who were injured at an initiation school in Palavurwa, and then a media statement issued by the Sierra Nas Commission in support of the Hindu festival of Diwal, 24 October, 2022, and the congratulatory message on the election of the newly reconstituted National House of Traditional and Quezon Leaders, and then a media statement issued by the Sierra Rice Commission condemning the attack on the Seventh-day Adventist Church by thugs in central Johannesburg. And uh, the last one is the media statement issued by the Sierra Rice Commission in respect of this uh, tragedy at Jaske River, which resulted in the death of about 14 members of Masuawe Church. I think this one everyone also saw in the media, uh, Sherry. So when it comes to social media, really it's just to share some highlights there to say, our Facebook has improved and gained uh, new followers, and uh, Facebook had about, uh, uh, you know, 13,800 likes and uh, 13,590 people following the CRL Facebook page. So it's just the audit that our media team has just uh, made in the third quarter just to see how people are interacting with the commission. When it comes to issues of human resources and related matters, um, the members, uh, Chairperson, uh, through through the chairperson, they will recall that uh, the commission is in the process of restructuring the organization. We are very much hopeful that this, uh, in the next two weeks, if not three, this process will now be concluded. So the benchmarking process of all positions in the organizational structure was finalized and the job evaluation panel was constitu constituted to validate the job levels. We are being assisted by the Department of Home Affairs and DPSA on this. 
uh, because we do not have uh, enough capacity to deal with these matters. Then the organizational structure developed as part of the restructuring has been approved now, and its implementation is likely to start in the new financial year. Um, again, Chair, the, we, we reported in the previous quarter that there was a vehicle that was stolen from the parking. The insurance claim of the stolen bike was settled, and the unit is finalizing the procurement of another bike and the eight to 10 seater minibus. I can say that um, we are replacing that stolen bike uh, with an Isuzu bike that we are getting uh, this month together with the eight ten sitter because we want to try and for cost saving measures uh, where we can travel as a group uh, it will be as uh, assisting us as an organization going to local communities so we come to the financial management uh, uh, slide there if we look at the composition our budget overall was 35374 and the composition there in terms of budget was 23738 and in that, uh, we spent 24.96, and the variance there was 3.242, which is a 14%. And I'm sure the CFO will give the details if needs be. And then goods and service, um, the budget was 11.637, and the actual was 11.299, and then we have a variance of 3.38 there. And then uh, the totals are as they stand in terms of the actual expenditure and the variance. Um, of 2702. Um, I'm sure we can go to the next slide. Then the underspending of 3242 million, which is 14% on composition of employees, is due to the vacant positions. And these positions were filled with acting point appointments, which created savings. We couldn't fill uh, these positions permanently pending the restructuring process that is going, that we are going through. And uh, we thought it would be advisable to wait for this process to conclude so that we can see how we stand as an organization in terms of uh, you know, appointments and uh, recruiting uh, uh, other employees within the organization. Then the underspending of 338K, 3% on goods and services, mainly due to savings in respect of professional services, such as legal services and savings on other cost items where, which were reallocated to meet needs on cost items for which the budget was insufficient. Um, but I must emphasize, Chair, that uh, we still um, give more of our expenditure to uh, programs, uh, main uh, core programs in the organization um, so that you know uh, we try to attain the mandate that we are created for. Of course, the challenges, Chair, is that um, we're still operating at a national level and the, the need for us to be at the local level. And I think in the previously in the minutes of the committees, I think uh, the, the committee agreed that uh, indeed this is uh, what the commission must do to be in local communities and they will do uh, anything to support the commission in terms of the resources to make sure that we are also having the uh, presence in local communities. Uh, I must say chair that uh, we are not just seated as well as a commission. We are we have embarked on a program uh, on that point of visibility um, with the executive office um, of meeting with um, provincial houses and uh, the premier's offices to also try and see if we can get spaces that we will not be able to pay to start uh, those uh, satellite offices in different provinces. As a result, tomorrow we'll be uh, having an engagement with the the Premier of um, um, Pumalanga, and uh, next week, Friday, we'll be having a meeting with the Premier of Limpopo, and uh, other, um, I think um, uh, it's likely to be on next week on the 7th, if it's Tuesday, we'll also be in the Free State doing the same work, and on the 14th, um, we'll be in the Northwest also engaging. So we are hoping that um, in these provinces, the leaderships there, they will be able to uh, give us um, uh, one or two spaces where we can be able to start with satellite offices. Mm -hmm. So while um, we know that the, the committee is working towards supporting us together with the departments and treasury around these matters, but we are also starting something so that this restructuring program that we are doing as an organization is not just uh, in vain at a national level, but it also help us to uh, you know, uh, uh, start the footprints in local communities in different provinces. So currently uh, we're doing work to the best of our ability under the human and financial constraints. And our purpose is to serve every community in our country 
although currently we do that with the limited human resources based at national office. Thank you very much, Chairperson. I hope I've saved a bit of your minutes. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you very much. Um, uh, we hope members were taking notes and uh, that uh, stage where they can engage with the presenters. Uh, I see the one is honorable space for now. Honorable space. Uh, honorable space. Yes, can Chair. Okay. Chair, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, sorry. I'm just on the road, so I am in an area that is quite um, bad in terms of reception, so I'm not going to um, switch on my camera, Chair, with your permission. Yes, allowed. Thank you, Chair. Chair, just first, really, um, a general comment that I want to make on, on, on all the three presentations, and particularly on when we come to this quarterly review. When, we re when one reads through this, it may, it's, you know, it all sounds very great. It, it looks all beautiful and all boxes are ticked, which makes it particularly difficult for one to really engage and ask questions. And so my concern that I have and that, I will all, that I've always had with performance measurement is that, you know, you, I have a problem applauding or praising people for doing what was expected of you to do. My my thing is always that it what what is it that you've done over and above of the boxes that you had to tick? So if you had ten out of ten meetings, that's all good and well. But what does it indicate? What is the impact measurement on that? And that is what I want to get to. So getting to Salga, for instance, where Salga um, mentions a number of issues which caught my eye, which was specifically on advocacy and strategic profile, the one on multi-sectoral um, support programs, the one on maturity assessment um, um, matters, you know, and surveys. The targets are indicated and it's indicating to us how in total how many municipalities have benefited. But what I think we have difficult in is seeing the impact of that. And Chair, I'm saying it in the background of the fact that we have 66 municipalities that are dysfunctional in this country, an increase of two more. So we were 64, we're at 66 now. So what I ideally would like to see, and I'm sure other committee members as well, is how, um, what is the impact of the actions or interventions or programs that Salga is implementing on dysfunctional municipalities as a start? So I would like to see a, uh, an action plan or impact measurement on the 66 municipal dysfunctional municipalities, as well as the non-dysfunctional non municipalities. Those are who are at least working. Because then, Chair, we can see that we are moving somewhere in terms of local government improving in this country. But at this very moment, we have many platforms, many structures, um, having, running a lot of programs, but we are not seeing that it translates into actual progress within local government and specifically in municipalities that are falling apart. And that's what I want to see. Salga, for instance, they are at all our oversight programs, um, visits. They are in attendance. My, my question to them on this quarterly re uh, review report is, what happens after those um, oversight programs? What interventions do you make immediately once you have for yourselves experienced on the ground what is actually happening as opposed to, as to some dashboard report or 
a report given to you on um you know um digitally um monthly or quarterly by municipalities so that is my concern chair um i don't want to ask questions because there is no questions to ask my question is just what is the measurement what is the impact measurement from the crl from the south from salga and um to the to the demarcation board in a to a lesser extent actually but mine is is, is on salga and and che i always maintain i'm not here to criticize i'm here to also give sort of recommendations as to what can be done um if one wants to improve this and that che is what i would like to just raise for today thank you for the opportunity okay, thank you uh it looks like um there are no more hands hey boche our hands are there myself keza gizela babumpumza oh can it be my system that's not showing you yes i can see now honorable prem kalipi thank you very much che yes. uh, um uh, i want to start by saying that if uh, the coo of salga can also help us with an updated uh, constitution as he alluding to the fact that there's some changes on the constitution of salga and one can also able to have that constitution and armed herself or himself uh, in order to check the issues that is raised by honorable speech here if it's covered by the constitution of salga because for me chairperson if salga is doing very well in terms of the paperwork and in terms of the updated programs as they are also doing it here but in terms of the really uh, issues uh, in the municipalities uh, salga seems as if they do, they have some problems as well at some point is beyond the beyond their control uh, for instance nje if i can make an example of the a uh, latest development let's say let me take unongoma for instance uh, whereby there is no one who have won that municipality and then everything falls apart after one political party said no i'm no longer in part of this uh, coalition or arrangement and it affects the service delivery automatically what is the plan of salga has been uh, um, adopted by salga itself is also going to be very disturbed so my point is that I don't know if they can share with us good in the situation because it seems as if most of the municipalities where the salka have clear programs to assist those municipalities but if the municipalities itself they don't have a clear program of how to run municipalities salka is having a problem as well so therefore what the issues those issues that are raised sharply by honorable speech salka must come into into this platform and explain what how do they intend to make their voice be known because they have a responsibility to assist those municipalities but if it's beyond their control and it's beyond to anyone's control it seems as if they are not going to make any inroad as well it's true i agree everywhere we go in if, even if we do the oversight and the president of salka now is a person who is very very active and um, his staff members they are there with us but the problem uh, which we all have to face it their role becomes um very redundant if i can put it that way i don't know chief person if my english is proper i know that i don't speak a proper english but their role becomes irrelevant when things are getting hot as i was making a, one of the example is is nongo even yesterday there are changes in zwan i know that they have plans to intervene because they must intervene and then their intervention in salga must be also be felt by the people on the ground is people of Tswane they are waiting for water they are waiting for service delivery they are waiting for all sort of of delivery uh, from from the from, from the municipality so that is my point chairperson and the ceo also spoke about uh, other stakeholders ngos whom they are, have partnered with but when i was looking at the presentation when he was speaking here I didn't see those NGOs. If you can come back uh, with the CEO and then elaborate on that factor and uh, for us to understand what, what is that partnership with those NGOs or other outside stakeholders benefit uh, the municipality uh, 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 at the end of the day. So I want to ask Chairperson also on the issue of uh, 
uh, that was raised, I think, by the findings raised by the Auditor General uh, in, uh, in terms of 10% uh, reduction in the number of findings raised by the Auditor General, uh, in, especially in, in Krisani district. But we, uh, the, the facts of the matter, the whole picture is that it is not Krisan district uh, only. We have receiving some, <coughs> when the municipalities are coming to do presentation, when we want them here in the portfolio committee, we also pick up that there is a salary bill that the municipality also can't even afford. So therefore, I think that in, Salga, in, the, in, the, in the age is finding, so there is also that aspect. So is, is the only Krisani that Salka have zoomed in? Also, they're talking about the municipal support program They're from Salga is a multi-sectoral municipal program support. So are, are they able to support all municipalities in totality or they have chose uh, other, uh, others uh, in, instead? On the municipal demarcation board, uh, we welcome the CEO and one of my COO was also uh, saying to me, but uh, privately in a joking way, saying that you are saying that you are welcoming this CEO because he's young. What do what what do what do you say about us who are old? And then I'm saying that no, all of you, you are very young. But in a lighter note, Chairperson, we welcome him, and we think that uh, he's going to also to help the board to go forward. But nevertheless, Chairperson, the presentation it was very detailed. And it also zoom in on what we always raised here in this committee, especially on the aspect of the consultation with the people on the ground. But my question is that, Chairperson, when we were told about the, the finances of the board, and most of the time when we take the board into task, saying that you are not, no, we, are, we are not visible, people are having some problems in terms of what delimination and what, 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 but you are not there to come to explain to people. And one of their reasons, they said that they don't have resources. And as a result, they depend on municipalities. But can we be explained now, uh, this surplus of 30 million, if it's still there, and what also informs that supplies? Because we think that they need each and every resources as, as, as the board to go and consult with people. They can do any all other aspects of it. But the main concern, the main concern of this committee is the consultation with people on the ground. So one of the slides also spoke about uh, the issue of um, a consultation and then they have to align it until 2025. I want to ask in terms of the, the bill that we are dealing with now as a committee, if their program is aligned until 2025, so what? where are they mapping up the bill? Where is the bill going to be affected there? And of which I don't, I, I don't, I don't say that Chairperson I'm disagreeing with their plans, but I just want to check in, Jay, in terms of the alignment with the new bill that is in front of the committee. And um, Chairperson, um, still on the demarcation board, uh, what has been the board's finding in relations to its analysis of 2,988 voting districts to determine a split communities? I'm asking this with specific, if you remember very well, Chair, on our last engagement when we were doing the oversight, when we were at their offices, and when we complained about their color of the body that is also very much aligned to a political party called Action SA or PA. And even today when they were introducing the CEO, I saw the chairperson of the board also still wearing that, <laughs> that, that color. We raise, uh, I was the one who was raising, the, even the chairperson of the board said that no, he's going to come to attend to those uh, issues that I was raising in 152. So now I, I, I don't see on their presentation, I know for the fact that the amended does not even, or oh, let me just rephrase it. I know that in the new bill, there is also an appeals committee whereby the communities, which if they are not uh, satisfied, uh, there's an appeals committee now, unlike now, uh, currently the situation. So I'm saying this because I saw in the, their presentation saying that the board have powers to decide or to agree with what issues, uh, what committees have, have raised these issues. So my, my, my concern is that when they go and consult with the community currently, with the, under the current act, and then they are having powers to decide. So it means it's a fruitless society most. For instance, in Ward 52, where the chair of the board promised to come, I even spoke to him outside the meeting, 
And then the deputy chair, which is my sister, me, and he said, no, I know it will be me who will come. They will never come. So if they're doing that to us as members of parliament, how much more the community, the vulnerable communities, the poorest of the poor, telling you that, no, this VD that we have put us, it belongs to another ward, which is very far from everything, even the council. I don't know that council that uh, you are saying that I must go and vote for. So those are the things that we need the board to go and attend and then to resolve. So if we raise those issues to the board on behalf of our people here and then get light to, what, what must we expect now? I'm just worried, Chairperson, because it seems as if we are, we are not taking serious. We raise issues not because we are bored or we Googling issues. We don't Google issues. We are also part and parcel of the communities. That's why we must bring issues here, clearly so saying that in what 52, there is a VD that is, 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 is in the what 57, of which is far from that what 57. But their clinics, their schools, their rivers is in what 52. Please come and listen to people and then resolve this matter. And then we get promised, no, we'll make time, we'll come. Now there's a 30 million, which is a surplus. And there's also 2,988 voting district uh, that determine split in communities. But the presentation does not say that. The presentation is of a high level, promising that no, we'll attend to issues of people, we'll attend to issues of people. And we are also reminded by Mr. Ramakata there that in fact, as a board, we can take a decision. But at the end of the day, who is suffering, Chairperson? It's not only that particular community who does not have a voice there. It's also the whole of the country. Remember during elections, there was a time whereby people say, we're not going to go to vote because we are, I mean, we are, we are misplaced. And then it affects everyone on the day of elections, whereby people are expected to go and vote for their uh, political party of their choice. It's because these issues are not attended to. And then the IEC will come and say, we've got nothing to do with this thing. Tina is to conduct elections here. So I'm saying, Chair, the chair of the board must come clean because he's got them um, now, according to the new act, he's going to have been empowered. I don't know if it's going to be him, but I'm saying that at least the roles are defined and the chair's got an executive powers. But now, since he's the chair here, we know that he went and lost the conference shame, the interest state, but nevertheless, he's still our chair of the board. But the issues that are raised here, it must be taken into, into consideration and it must be implemented. We can't afford that situation that we can come here, raise issues, and then get ignored. And then when they come again, we must pretend as if everything is fine. No issues that were supposed to be to, to be resolved before. It can't work like that, Chairperson. Otherwise, we are, we are playing. We are just clownish here in this committee. So those are my issues, Chairperson. Thanks very much. I'll, I'll listen on answers. Uh, Honorable Teza. Um, good morning, Chairperson and uh, Honorable Members. Uh, uh, just a few questions, very, very few, Chair, um, pertaining to the entities of COPTA. If they are going to indeed, Chair, um, not indicate uh, in terms of the 66 dysfunctional municipalities across the country, that their programs uh, have impacted uh, towards the positive in terms of the improvement of, of their audit status, but not only that, but in terms of their service delivery. Uh, anything can be said here, and we can be sweet-tongued in the committee and present a very rosy, rosy picture, as it is always the case with presentations, of course. Uh, but as long as it doesn't translate to, to the functionality and the viability of those municipalities, categorized, which have escalated from 64 to the now uh, uh, 66 categorized dysfunctional municipalities, we are not going to be convinced with anything from now today. So meaning that they should link what they are doing in terms of their programs to actually impact on the state of, uh, of the municipalities in which they are operating. That's number one, Jay. 
Number two being uh, the MDB, the Municipal Demarcation Board Chair, uh, in terms of the municipal uh, 2022 and 2022, 2023 uh, municipal redetermination. Because any local municipality uh, sitting here, Chair, I have a proposal, a proposed uh, delimitation, uh, redetermination of that municipality to Mutlabe. And it's not even right down the road to uh, Echlanzeni municipality, jumps Echlanzeni municipality, and it goes to Mutlabe. I just want to get an understanding of this redetermination of the demarcation board. What informs them? in terms of the socioeconomic benefits of the, of, of, of the communities that they are, they are inculcating in, into, into, into such a, a, a far a, apart municipalities. I, 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 just, I just want that because the next thing we are going to hear, because th that municipality is under Ngangala district. The next thing that we are going to hear, we're going to hear down the road in, in N4, we're going to hear that Victor Kanye is under a guru uh, without having to, to hear about the benefits thereof that uh, have, have they considered. Uh, let alone uh, the, 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 the consultations uh, of those communities. I'll tell you what, Chair, in my branch in Middleburg in Ward 28, uh, in terms of the norm, I just want to ask, we have a community there that has been, the ward that has been delimited, resulting in 870 registered voters. No clinic, no nothing. A street away, there is a school uh, in which uh, the erstwhile branch was voting in that school. Now we have a tent where we are voting. What constitutes these decisions, Jack? Because up just across the street from 1994, we, 96, we were 94, we were actually uh, voting there. Uh, I, 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 I don't understand. Maybe, maybe uh, some, some criteria needs to be studied and needs to be workshopped in the in the in the in the in the, in the and clarify it here and simplify it because every time we must come back to these questions. And then uh, I just want to ask uh, in terms of Saga, last time we spoke to the issues of the councillor training and the tools of trade and standardization of the regulations into the benefits of those because in some municipalities and district municipalities, uh, in Gangala, again, uh, you, you have different uh, uh, beneficiation uh, strategies, uh, uh, regulations. A, a councillor may, 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 might, might have that phone, but uh, he, won't, he will forfeit it at the end of the, of the term. And, uh, and, and that's it. Uh, the, 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 she, will, she will be left phoneless. And I don't understand that. And uh, in terms of uh, um, now the the issue of 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 of, of the current demarcation act which affords the minister uh, in terms of the appointment procedure uh, just just tell us uh, where are the people in these things why should the minister uh, be given a, 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 a task, a, a loan task uh, without the involvement because there's, there's no us without us. These things are going to affect us severely and, and, and they are going to affect the communities as severely as they do now. How can you do not have a representation of the people there? Uh, I think those are the issues that I want to raise, Chair. Thank you very much. Uh, Honorable Opperman. Good morning, Chairperson and colleagues. Morning. So our job as a portfolio committee is to identify the red flags 
early on and plan mitigating and remedial intervention strategies accordingly. But when the picture painted to us as an extremely rose-colored one, as difficult to assist as a healthy person doesn't need a doctor. So I'd like to know from Salga, your presentation mentioned on almost every slide how and how many municipalities you assisted. But sometimes assistance are given, but with the wrong or not so urgent issues, because it is a sad fact that municipalities are failing dismally, despite all these slides of assistance, intervention and support. So did you assist municipalities under administration? And are these municipalities better off now after the interventions? Are the problems solved? And if not, why not? And how are you as a local government association dealing with the lack of consequence management in many municipalities? And does Salga have plans in place to assist municipalities to find solutions for municipal debt arising from electricity and water services? And how are you assisting municipalities that have high salary increases way over the inflation rate? And all municipalities almost outsource for forensic and legal services. And 44% of municipalities fail to investigate the findings of the Auditor General. Are Salga assisting with these issues? And do they perhaps know how much I spend on forensic reports within municipalities? Then to the MDB, you still have no regional footprint and therefore little to no presence provincially. You need to be provincially based in order to understand through municipal dynamics. So where do the MDB fit into the district development model and will the budget be used to increase your local footprint? And then local issues are mostly about service delivery. So when you add new boundaries through demarcation, you also stress the service delivery challenges of mostly debt burdened municipalities even more and the allocated budgets they receive. So I want to know how will the MDB solve this problem? This problem, and due to gross underfunding in the past, you lost a lot of skills in your department, had, and you had to over rely on outsourcing. Is that still the case? And what mitigating strategies do you have in place for that? And then I have a question to the CRL. You truly are underfunded, there is no denying that. But who will take your budgetary constraints serious while you are still underspending on the budget you are receiving? And what are your reasons for your underspending? Thank you, Chairperson. Thank you, Honorable Bumza. <clears throat> Uh, thank you, Chairperson, and uh, good morning, and the colleagues, uh, the President of Salga, the Chair of MDP, and the Chair of the CIR, Professor. Chair, Chair uh, starting with the Salga Chair, it has been indicated. Oh, first, Chair, allow me not to open up my camera. The Loud. 66 municipalities have been proclaimed dysfunctional. At some particular point in the interaction with Salga, and when this issue was raised of the regression of municipalities to a state of dysfunctionality, the president of Salga it uh, clearly identified uh, the, the challenge and he indicated that, uh, that the elephant uh, is in the room and uh, that there, then uh, 
the department and Salka needs to deal with this elephant in the room. And uh, he, at that particular time, called for, I don't know whether was it a session or a summit, wherein then we will be in a position uh, to deal with that elephant that Salka had identified to be in the room. Now, has Salka apparently abandoned that particular call? Because I don't remember at any stage that we had had a session because the local government summit that was in Beckwood was not actually dealing with this particular elephant in the room. Uh, Salka now decided to, to retract the call for a session wherein this matter of the elephant in the room would be dealt with being a dominating causative factor to the state of local government. That municipalities are dysfunctional. That's one share with Salga. Coming to the chair of the demarcation board and the CEO. The, the white paper on local government had made a, profice, a promise or made envisaged wall to wall viable municipalities. And then, therefore, out of that white paper on local government, with all this number of pieces of legislation, inclusive of the Demarcation Act, and the rationale behind this Demarcation Act was on the main to redress the special segregated communities in South Africa, as well as how the physical environment had been effectively used by apartheid uh, to actually segregate uh, human settlements in the country and making some of these settlement areas unbearable because they were uneconomic. Now, the key objective had been of the Demarcation Act to redress by demarcating these boundaries to reverse segregation. Hence, even in the mission of uh, the demarcation board is related to special transformation, just and sustainable committees. And the vision, you could see that it had to address that. But practically when we're looking at it, and I don't think that because it is the IEC that is charged with the deepening of democracy through its, as a mandate, through its processes. But when you look at the way we are demarcating or doing some of these things, we, we, we still, the, the, the South African society is still demarcated in the old apartheid sense, we have not addressed this issue of reversing these imbalances. And the demarcation board, understanding its mandate, perhaps uh, it should not be more focusing on uh, demilitating words and redetermining words for the purposes of uh, uh, establishing VTs and everything for the elective for, for the for, 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 for the IEC. But more primarily, this must address uh, 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 and reverse segregation uh, in order to establish these uh, cohesive sustainable communities. That's the one point chair that I am looking at. I, I, I need to add to perhaps the chair would convince me otherwise that practically while using this instrument, are we driving to achieve cohesive communities by reversing a segregated communities? And also ensuring that we're establishing viable wall-to-wall -wall municipalities that 
by viability, we mean municipalities that whose economies are vibrant so that people could live and make and, and live and make better livelihoods. Chair, the, the board here is stating that uh, it has characterized this redetermination to class one to uh, up to four. I understand now, earlier on with this class one, I was confused. Now I am in a better position. But on the same slide around the around the issue of uh, the, 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 the demarcation. We have here a table that indicates that uh, there are few class four, very few class four categories of this redetermination. Um, uh, there are only many in case that end. Could we be explained what? does this class four entails uh, so that we, we, we better understand why there are so many in KZN, there are one, one in other provinces and none in others, this class four determination. Uh, leaving that chair, uh, coming to the CIR. In the in the in the slide on the research and the and the policy, particularly the resuscitation of uh, diminished heritages. At some particular point, when we're interacting with the board, it had reported that uh, it was this research and policy development was busy working on research to resuscitate diminished uh, languages. Now here you are the caves and the others and rivers. Now, could we be briefed as to at what stage are those diminished languages has been researched and developed so that they could be in a position that they are navigated towards being um, one of the 11 official languages. Also, Che, in the media it was reported, I think the CEO has touched on this matter, that uh, 10 people uh, died on the Jackson River. And uh, then the media, when was reporting this matter, it was saying that uh, these people uh, died as a result of a cultural ritual. And now I hope that the CIR has made its own investigation and findings as to what was the causative factor for these people to die on the Jackson River. It's not only those, I think in the other river, it was Snake and San Soweto. There was a similar event where people, they died on a river. So these are matters. One, when, 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 Perhaps the faith of other communities by the media would be reduced into a cultural ritual and it would not be a religion or a faith, whatever, but it would depict it as cultural, a demeaning it. But the point I am driving it as to what had been the causative factor for those people to die on the river, were they drowned or whatever. The other point here is that. Uh, what is the role of uh, uh, the CRA around this issue of our uh, uh, cultural heritage, the initiation? So we have a number of deaths also in the last season in the Eastern Cape. And uh, what is the role that the CRA is planning to ensure that uh, this, uh, the sanctity of this cultural practice is actually saved from being continually tarnished by the deaths that are happening uh, during uh, the initiation season. Thanks, Chair.
thank you very much. Um, honorable uh, members, I think now is the turn for uh, responses from the Salka Rights Commission, but uh, uh, we are focusing on the implementation of the annual performance plans for the financial year ending 31 March 2023, and specifically focusing on the third quarter. In other words, there are issues here where we, we need to, uh, when we are going to contract for the coming financial year, we must make sure that uh, as we develop those annual performance plans, uh, members are alert so that we, we don't uh, have a problem. When somebody says, I had this target, I've achieved it 100%, then once we start having a problem at that stage, it then says we were not awake when we contracted at the beginning of the financial year. I just wanted to raise that, but otherwise, uh, uh, Honorable o o Salga, uh, MTP, MCR Commission, can we respond? Um, th thank you very much, Chair. Um, and uh, I think let me start. I think Lance will and the team. I think I've seen uh, the Deputy President Flora and uh, and the Acting CEO uh, Nolu Chung and other um, management team from South in the platform. <clears throat> I think I think let me start where you are, and uh, um, I, I concur with you. Uh, I think the invitation that was shared with me by Lance uh, from your committee it was to say, come, give an account of the last quarter. Now we have given the account of the last quarter and on a wish of the targets that were set. Now the committee is saying, yes, as much as it might uh, be seen rosy and so on, we have achieved what we have targeted, 80%. Uh, of it, and uh, and I think I do take a sense that says uh, it will be important going into the fourth quarter to be considerate of the following issues, which I think to me it's a it's a um, um, uh, an important point to be factored in our planning going forward uh, in in an endeavor to drive the change uh, in in the local government sector. I think that that is that is that will be my starting point. The second point, Chair, is that uh, it, it, I find very difficult um, interacting with the committee that contest elections because members of parliament are the individual members that belong to political parties that contest elections. So it will be very good to have this conversation, Honorable Mumza, which many of the leaders are running away from it. Uh, dealing with this elephant in the room, and the elephant in the room, when we are given a, a time, will unpack it because it affects everybody. Uh, it affects everybody that contests elections. And that is why probably, if you look into the example that was made by um, Honorable Mkalepi uh, on Spana and many other things, will tell you a story uh, of that, that all of those that are contesting elections are at guilty as charged. And therefore, all those are members of parliament are making laws. And therefore, they are required to, to, to deal with the matter uh, in a manner that befits uh, to drive the interest of the nation building, creating a better society, and making sure that it, it, it prosper and go forward. I think to me, uh, it, when, it, when time is given to us, we will unpack this and unapologetically about it, uh, because the intention is to correct what is happening in, in, in the local government space. Um, I, I, I think, Chair, 
the 63, it, 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 it seemed to be a number that uh, 62, 64 is growing dysfunctional municipality. The proper debate at the proper time, when we have that time, is when we conceived the idea of establishing municipal system in South Africa, did we ask right questions such as, what is the cost of rendering service? Have we costed the rendering of service or it was just to put municipalities together and declare them as municipalities? So, so I think at an appropriate time, it will be important for us to deliberate on that because uh, the, the journey of local government has proven now that the assumptions that were made then at the conception of the local government, those realities become not, uh, 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 those assumptions becomes not uh, applicable issues that applies in today's local government business going into the future. I will make an example here, maybe to depart on this issue. I hope we know, uh, we spoke about wall-to-wall -wall municipal system. And I hope in, in the assessment that we have made through reports that we are getting, Salka is not getting section 71 report, no section 72 or uh, section 46 report. It's parliament that is getting that and the departments that are getting that. Uh, 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 information uh, to us is as a result of our interaction with municipalities, but there is no law that compels municipalities to give any report to, to, to Salka. But what, what the issue that I'm raising there, Chair, is looking into those reports, it tells you that the, 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 the pay base or the tax base over a period of time of a municipality has shrunk. And that is why in the State of the Nation address, our contribution as Salga, we said, as you look into load shedding as a crisis, so as the rain, but also look into the revenue base of a municipality because it's a crisis because of policy decisions that parliament takes for instance, Parliament have adopted IPPs, independent power producers. What does this mean in line with Schedule 4 as we are choosing in court today? That is our responsibility to render, uh, I mean, to generate electricity. What it means, it means there is a departure from um, the white paper of 1998 on protection and making municipality to have an instrument of retitulation as a source of income to municipality. That's what we are saying, and that's what we are threatening. And therefore, I hope as you implement, you won't be surprised when from 62 dysfunctional municipality goes to 257 municipal dysfunctional. Because when you look and approve these processes, we are not holistic. It's, it's on piecemeal basis, on the agent basis that has been presented before parliament, not taking into the total view of the impact of this decision. So as the decision that has been announced just recently on the solar, or the way to call it a rooftop solar. Have you made a deeper assessment of the financial viability or financial implication into municipality, which in terms of schedule four and schedule five of the constitution, give that executive authority to an entity called a municipality. So I'm saying, I'm saying, Chair, I hope we will have time at one day to, 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 to express these issues and dangers that you are seeing that are threatening local government as a, a, as a body going forward. It's so as, as, so as applied, Chair, on the parliament agreeing to create grave sites. And when the grave site is no longer existing or no longer able to provide services, and the blame is a municipality. For instance, a biosmal deer is a grave site that was created out of Act of Parliament. So as Inokum Pijima is a grave site that they've created out of Act of Parliament. And, and, and that Act of Parliament begins to say, combine two dysfunctional municipalities with a historically performing municipality, which it was Queenstown at that time, which it was able to pay and their customers or uh, ratepayers were able to pay, but Nkwanta and Solwana were in IPL to pay. 
and it was completely dysfunctional, and then you combine it. So, so I'm saying some of these dysfunctional, I mean, um, uh, municipalities that we're talking about, we must also look from where have we contributed as parliament to create a system that is going to be difficult for municipalities to operate going forward. I think that uh, the, the honorable Claire also asked the issue about did these intervention functions, to as far as we are concerned, honorable Claire, and and the proof is on the table given by the uh, by the uh, national treasure itself making research when we made a call as the association that we are gravitating towards a dangerous zone because intervention has never worked. And National Treasure, through its uh, research, it came back and confirmed what we have said. Let me make you an example, for instance, now, as we, as we are sitting here. Uh, the, the, the parliament, through national government, intervened in Mangaung and uh, sent a team of about 10 uh, individuals. The last two years, nothing that has happened in Mangaung. It has never turned the corner. Yet Mangaung had to pop up money that is paid through the uh, 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 taxpayers in Mangaung, limited as small as they are, and they beef up the salary and other benefit of those that have been deployed. It's nothing happened. So as uh, M. Fule in Gauti, it has been on 10 years intervention. It has never seen the light of the day. And the intervention is driven by national and the province municipality is just a recipient of that. And in fully, as we speak today, it has never seen the light of the day. So the capacity is at national, it's not at local. And But why it's not changing? Have we, have we asked ourselves and look one another into the eyes and say, why is not changing? And what is it that we're not doing right? So as I'm, I'm hearing many members anywhere where I, I go, they speak about Maluta Pufung. Have we asked how many you know, that municipality have been under intervention for the last, um, uh, since its uh, inception. I don't think anyone re remember that. At the time intervention came in M. Fulane, they were owing something like uh, um, uh, 400 uh, uh, million uh, to, to ESCOM. Today they're running to billions under the stewardship and leadership administratively of properly to be supported, to be supposedly competent individuals in the national and provincial government. So as Manuta Pufung, 11 billion, and so on. So what I'm saying, when we look into the challenges that are confronting local government, we must first look from what is the origin of these problems and why uh, we are at the point where we are today and how do we then collaboratively and cooperatively turn and make sure that we make these municipalities function. There's a very telling story that is said here by CRL, very telling, and I hope members, they're listening to that story. It's a very telling story. The CEO in the presentation says, we have lost a bag, it has been stolen. And we're in the process of buying, uh, purchasing something so that we can go as a team. Uh, underlying that message, it says, there is a high level of criminality in the country and violence. And that violence, we experience it as local government because we have been saying in parliament and every platform, councillors are killed, municipal officials are killed. Now it has gone beyond councillors and municipal officials. It affected the traditional leaders. And I learned with shock that also killing can take uh, place in the universities. And that is why the two security guards uh, in the University of Forte were shot and killed. Because the, probably the individuals were wanting to do a right thing, but the environment doesn't permit them to do that. So when we look into these issues, we, ne we need to look at them holistically so that we have a better intervention in the municipal system. For us, we have, as Salga, we've got a lot of interventions that we have been making in municipalities, but it takes two. Remember, leadership, I said in parliament on the, day, on the debate, we are talking about coalition governments. For instance, in, in, in Fane, is unstable today, there's a fight in Twane and many other issues that have been raised. And we said to the leader of the op official opposition leader of Democratic Alliance, it's important for us to confront this an uh, animal. So as what we said to the African National Congress and other parties, and that is why we have make, making a, an example of Nelson Mandela uh, in terms of coalition. The issue, Chair, 
for having a better governance, better service delivery, you must create conducive, better political environment. And people that must create better political environment are those that are contesting elections. And in Salga, unfortunately, in the establishment of a municipality, ours, it, we can look it this far. And that is why we have put together a framework, we have spent money to investigate possibilities, and we put that to you as parliament, because we are the one that have a responsibility to legislate and do laws that must curb the behavior and drive a particular program towards what the nation and the country wants to achieve. So I'm saying here, as we look into all these issues, these are the issues that Salga is looking at, and we are looking at these issues, and we are engaging almost every board. It depends on the engagement. As the person that you are engaging is listening or is not listening or pushing a particular interest that we may not be aware. But local government, as, as, as a local government uh, sector, is highly affected. Today, we are shocked about 62, 64 dysfunctional municipalities. If we go with this pace, it's going to be 257. And I hope at that time we won't say it's only a crisis. Coming to the issues of the payment uh, of inability to pay, FCOM and so on, Parliament, it must be at least uh, try to work with communities and municipalities. It is wrong, uh, Chair. Let me put it here today as I put it to other platforms. It is wrong to allow an entity of state to break the law, ESCOM in this case. Over many years, ESCOM has been allowed to rob the poor, and the poor in this case is a municipality. How does the ESCOM rob the poor? ESCOM has been allowed by our own government, ourselves, to charge municipalities double tax a month charge municipality what is called a maximum demand. Yet the country agreed about development and ability to create and electrify communities at large. Now, when municipalities do that, they are charged. And the parliament says, no, but you still have to pay them. For instance, let me make a last point on this issue. The 18% that is perpetrated or is raised by NARSA, what is its, its, its implication? To municipalities, to, 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 to communities. Here's the implication, Chair, practically. NERSA took a decision that the, the 18% must be implemented now in April. The financial year of the municipality is going to be three months from now. Who's going to pay this 18%? Are we not contributing towards a bubbling um, uh, debt into ESCOM? And if now it's 18%, when municipality at its financial period consider this, is going to put its more cap and it will be 26%, 36%, and it's transferred to the poor, struggling and ailing communities, people that are unable to pay. So, so what I'm saying, when we deal with these issues, we need to be holistic rather than at a piecemeal basis, because piecemeal basis, it, it doesn't give us a helicopter view to see, are we making an impact in transforming local government and thereby expeditiously render services to communities. Uh, let, let, let me end there. And uh, I think Lance and, and so on will deal. I thought, let me deal with this broader political and policy issues that uh, the country needs to deal with. Thank you very much, Chair. Thank you. Well, no, thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Um, oh. Before Lance comes in. Yes. Uh, 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 greetings to the chairperson, the president, and the Chairperson of the board and members of uh, the committee, good afternoon. I think it's now, or it's still the morning. Good morning. Um, I am pleased that uh, we have, uh, as the president of SALGA indicated, we have submitted. And, uh, and it is seen how far we have went, which is why there are questions uh, that are raised. Maybe starting with a question that says, the elephant of the, uh, the elephant in the room, and that we must still sit. It's not abandoned, uh, honourable member. We are still ready because uh, some of the information that we need to talk about here. We are having a number of other structures. Maybe if we still continue and push, and if the committee members 
can also push from their corners. That Sarga said a, 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 an elephant in the room is an issue that must be dealt with. Uh, let's push all of us because we are still waiting and we still have to talk. Issues of, as I come in on these matters, uh, I am impressed with the questions that members asked. And um, Councillor Mkali, um, Honorable Mkalipi, sorry, I'm a councillor, I always say councillor. She asked very important questions. What is it that we are doing as SALG? 66 municipalities are dysfunctional, and here the report is gloomy and beautiful. Uh, I remember I wrote an an assignment once and it was so beautiful, but I received less marks and I asked the professor and he said, no, the content and what must be there, uh, we do not see. As Salga, we have a mandate and we stick to that mandate. Now, it depends on the issues at local government. As the president has indicated that there are parties that deployed people to go and represent those parties in, in local government. And surely we are getting in, capacitating them and assisting in a number of areas like formulation of the framework on how to do uh, their work and all that. But pushing them is like taking a horse to the river and, and, and you know, you can't uh, uh, hold the neck of the horse and push it down to drink. Now I'm getting to the issues of ethics, that should any councillor to be found to be unethical on some matters, the party that deployed that person must chip in and call orders or maybe uh, uh, act in a manner that they will be able to look back and say, you have received this kind of training, uh, uh, you have received this capacitation, what makes you to fail to implement what makes you to fail to do as uh, having been capacitated. So that is part of the elephant that is in the room. I'm saying that because as Salga, we cannot go to a municipality and say, we have taught you to work like this and you are not doing it. So we are replacing you. Parties are deploying people in there. And we are here as Salga. In that meeting of the elephant, dealing with the big uh, elephant in that room, it will then be said, Salga, what have you done? Have you given them this? Have you trained them on this? Have you capacitated? And if the, the, the register is marked as, as, uh, as yes, then a uh, uh, consequence management must follow by the party that deployed that person. So. What uh, makes it difficult for us to look at issues of consequence uh, management, uh, Honorable Mkalip and others, is that uh, we have not deployed people there, but we capacitate, we give them ways on how to work. And if they do not do that, parties must then come in and, 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 and say, this is what we need to do. On the administration, province, or even national, they send their members to go and assist in a municipality they think it's not, or the municipality that is not uh, coping or not doing well. But what we have learned and have experienced there, once those people are sent there first, their capacity and knowledge of local government is minimal. It's even worse than the people who made a mess. And as to how they are monitored, it becomes difficult to us because they're not accounting, uh, they are accounting to national or the province, whoever deployed them. Maybe in that meeting, I support the member who is asking if that meeting is still standing, that request. And that request, I think, must, if it's not more, no more standing, we must, uh, 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 revoke that uh, resolution and say, we must go and there in that meeting, we will be able to deal with these matters and say, province, what do you do? How do you monitor them? What is the measuring tool as after the people have been deployed there? Do you really monitor and measure in terms of the mandates 
in terms of reference that they are given. Uh, and if that is not done, we must come up with another plan and say this administration issues, the deployment of people from wherever doesn't work. And how do we then get an alternative way to assist municipalities? So I, I, I want to believe uh, the president has uh, uh, responded to a number of questions that were raised here, but uh, he was very smart when he spoke about 18%. We had a Lekhutla of Salga that set uh, uh, two weeks ago. And in that Lekhutla, our members told us straight to say, go there and indicate that you reject this increase of 18%. Uh, from by, by, by NERSA. So we really are open. The meeting must take off to deal with the elephant in the room. Thank you very much, Chair. Uh, uh, acting CEO. Thanks. No, no, thank you very much, uh, the chairperson. No, I paused because the chair was calling the acting CEO. Um, but, oh. but let me, you know, while whilst he's doing that, he's, he's by preparing himself. The, 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 the chairperson, the, the, the honorable members, uh, all five that spoke, uh, honorable Spies, honorable Mkalipa, honorable Treza, honorable Opperman, and honorable Mpumza uh, raised a very similar issue uh, that I will respond to, um, and and it is it is is related to a number of areas. Firstly, it 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 almost questions the relevance of the work that we do as Salga, and further to that, also ask the question: in that work that we do, in that relevance that we seek, are we make are we making any impact? And impact, I understand members are saying, there is this list of municipalities that are locked up into a state of dysfunction. To what extent does Salka direct its resources towards assisting those municipalities? That is what I'm hearing being raised across all five members. Here is our response, um, uh, uh, Chairperson, is that we, we have realized, uh, of course, with the benefit of experience and time, that the, the challenges of municipalities are not singular in nature. And, and for us, we had, we had identified four key challenges. And last year, when we came to present Salga's five-year plan, as well as its APP, we drew attention to these four core root causes of why local government finds itself in the state. The first one we said was poor political leadership and administrative leadership in municipalities. We had said, secondly, weak financial sustainability of municipalities. We had said, thirdly, lack of mechanisms and processes to deliver services. And lastly, we had said that, um, uh, the infrastructure uh, to deliver services uh, are dilapidated. We repeat this, uh, Chairperson, because we, we are saying that we can't therefore take a silo approach in supporting municipalities. So uh, we, we are saying that we need to focus on multidisciplinary support so that there is greater impact on uh, the support that we are directing to municipalities. But we're also saying that the support to be directed to municipalities should not only come from Salga, we are nowhere close to having the capacity to respond to all 257 municipalities. And therefore the point that we have made that we are drawing on others who have capacity uh, in addition to ours uh, to direct support to municipalities. And, and here at the chairperson, we are talking to research institutions, your academic institutions. We are talking to, to NGOs. We are talking to the private sector 
Uh, we are talking to organized formations of business. We're talking to organized formations of communities. We're talking to organized formations of the religious groups so, uh, so that all of us come on board to direct support to assist our municipalities. Uh, and that is the approach that we have taken. And we, it's as if all members were recently present. Uh, uh, Councillor Boltman raised the issue around the NEC having met two weeks ago, and it was followed by further engagement uh, at an administrative level. It's as if you were with us in the room to say that it is important that Salga as it directs uh, support to municipalities there must be relevance of that support to municipalities that are seriously struggling. So whether it's a list of 63 or whether it's a list of 68 or whether it is the long list of uh, municipalities with disclaimer opinions, uh, et cetera, uh, whether it's municipalities that are having governance challenges because of collisions, there must be a relationship between where we direct our support and where it is needed. And we have acknowledged that. And that is where we are directing our support so that there is greater relevance in the work that we do. But probably more importantly, as raised by Honorable Spies, there is greater impact so that we can say a year or so from now that things have changed and there's turnaround in that municipality linked to the support uh, that is and the intervention that have been directed um, to those uh, municipalities. I'm hoping that uh, that part is understood uh, and we will further reflect on that perhaps um, uh, when an op further opportunity is given to us, um, uh, Chairperson. Also a question that came up, what happens after uh, these oversight visits? Well, there is quite a bit that happens behind the scenes, uh, Honorable Chairperson. Uh, perhaps I can indicate to you the NEC of Salga has taken a decision that it will interact with municipalities directly. So since this new NEC has been elected a year ago, uh, we are now going to our third province, having been in the Western Cape and interacted with the 30 municipalities in the Western Cape, having been to the Northern Cape and having interacted with all municipalities in the Northern Cape. Uh, two weeks from now, we are in the Northwest and similarly interacting with municipalities in the Northwest. This is preceded, of course, by provincial executive committees of Salga, also directly interacting with municipalities. So the idea is to take the issues that are emerging from oversight visits into our governance structures, engage with them with a view for us to be solution driven and, uh, um, and directly uh, address the issues that are emerging from these different sessions. So there's ongoing engagements uh, directly with municipalities uh, to see direct responses and results um, uh, based, based on the issues that emerges from the, the oversight, uh, oversight uh, visits. Um, uh, the, the, the last point I would respond to Honorable Chairperson is the issue also raised by Honorable Opperman and it relates to electricity and water debt of municipalities and what are we doing as Salk? Um, the first point we must make, pre pre uh, the Chairperson, is that there is a lot of focus and we think unfairly so on municipal debt. Uh, let me be clear on that. As we speak, municipalities owe its creditors as at the end of uh, uh, September just over 86 billion. So that's what municipalities owe, and it includes ESCOM and Waterbots, 86 billion. And whenever we switch on the radio or the TV, there is a link between the dysfunctionality of ESCOM and the debts owed by municipalities to ESCOM. Now, the reality is factually, Chairperson, the overall ESCOM debt Municipalities only comprise 10% of that, 10% of ESCOM's overall debt. How is it that municipalities are then with that 10% blamed for the dysfunctionality of ESCOM? You can do the same uh, uh, maths on water boards. 
what they are owed. But the finger is always pointed at municipalities. But the question we are not asking, Chairperson, and this is what we want to bring to the portfolio committee, is that there's 290 billion owed to municipalities and no one is interested. 290 billion owed by government, business and households to municipalities. No one wants to talk about it, uh, but everyone wants to talk about what is owed to ESCOM, what is owed to Water Board. So we are really hoping that this day will be soon where there is more attention on what is owed, the 290 billion that is owed to municipalities and how everyone else can similarly make noise to get municipalities uh, the 290 billion that is owed to them because it will assist them also to service their own debt, which a total sits at 86 billion. Um, you can do the math and you can clearly see that if municipalities receive what is due to them, they would be able to service their own debt. Uh, and there's a direct relationship between, between the two. What are we doing at Salga? We have for years, Chairperson, been calling on municipalities to aggressively implement credit control measures. So we have seen in the recent past, municipalities doing exactly that. And what happens in the media? There is noise about who a municipality cuts off. And these people owe business or otherwise, owe huge amounts to municipalities. And when a municipality wants to collect, by enforcing credit control, there is noise. There is noise. Um, uh, but we will not stop there. The NEC of Salga has been clear. Municipalities must continue to aggressively implement credit control measures, including disconnecting those that are in the rears uh, and outside of the framework of the municipal credit control policies. Councillor uh, Boltman has already reflected. We are in court already on ESCOM. And as the NEC has decided, we are now uh, this week filing our second application uh, against ESCOM and NERSA. So we will fight this thing outside of the IGR framework space because we are not um, uh, getting the results from the IGR um, uh, space and we are having no option but to approach the courts uh, in order to get the necessary um, redress. I will pause there, uh, Chairperson, and thank you very much. Too much. Uh, can we then move to demarcation board? Thank you, Chairperson. Let me also acknowledge my colleagues from CRL. I don't think I did acknowledge when we started, Chairperson. Chairperson, I will not go into the color of politics or politics of color. Um, I will just concentrate on the issues pertaining to performance as um, raised by members. Chairperson, the issue of the 30 million that is um, termed uh, a surplus, let me indicate, because this is a report on uh, quarter performance. It is, um, we are indicating what we have spent to date. And of course, that means up to the end of December. And you would have seen in that slide, uh, Chairperson, that we are indicating that uh, there are programs that we are engaged on which are already in progress. So the 30 million that is remaining for the year, it is basically uh, being spent on those programs. So it is not going to be a surplus. Basically, by the end of the financial year, this money will be spent on those programs. Intranet, the research on boundary redetermination, and of course, on matters pertaining to promotion, advertisement for stakeholder engagement. Uh, that's where basically mostly the money will be spent on. And uh, Chairperson, yes, there are issues that uh, members are raising, which I think are, are quite uh, important. This is a Krumale ARC Ward 25. But uh, honorable member has indicated and in making an example, for instance, Nyendao Yasei Makazin, to say 
the, dev the demarcation board might redetermine boundaries in a manner that basically would not necessarily be acceptable. I'm just generally now putting it. Um, let me indicate two members. One, the demarcation board, although the act allows the board to initiate on its own accord any redetermination, since its establishment to date, the demarcation board has not done that. The demarcation board has been considering applications from the communities and, of course, stakeholders. That basically is the issue. I'm trying to say it is not the board that has initiated any redetermination. It is applications that are coming from communities. And it is those applications that basically we look into and go through the processes as explained. What I think would be maybe important and helpful for members is for the committee maybe to get the list of all the applications that we have received to date. In other words, the applications that we'll be dealing with. I'm talking about your classification two, three, and four. The reasons why in this province there are so many on this and that are basically not what we consider in terms of the act. We just look into the application and look into the factors as uh, basically stipulated in the act. But I think it will be proper for members to get all those that we have received so that they be informed. I must indicate from our side, uh, Chairperson, we have gone to all the provinces and we have engaged with all the MECs of COGTA. And in some cases also, in the committees where MECs are meeting with uh, mayors to give presentations about the applications in their own uh, provinces. Because one way or another, where two municipalities are affected, of course, you would also need to get um, consensus or an agreement from the affected uh, municipalities and so forth. So we did present to provinces about applications in their provinces because it's supposed to be an open process. And maybe uh, we should find a way of uh, presenting to the committee on all those uh, applications and then members will then be able to see in which areas where they might be having direct interest and so forth and be able to pick up issues there. Of course, we can't uh, um, in a way discuss the applications uh, in this platform when we would be indicating where exactly the applications are from and so on. Yes, um, honorable member Opperman, we still have a problem with provincial uh, footprint. But what we have done is to also increase on our research capacity so that we don't outsource on most of the work that we are doing. At the moment, we still are being assisted by also outside bodies on the issue of capacity because it's a very intense uh, exercise, capacity on municipalities, because we have to look into the infrastructure the municipalities having, uh, the functions that the municipality is performing, uh, all the necessary geo factors that are in a municipality. You know, it's a whole range of issues. And of course, including uh, the functions that the municipalities are basically performing. So it is in that area, but in most areas, we also have decided internally to do our own uh, research. And that is why we have increased the capacity on, on that. The provincial uh, footprint is quite a problem because national treasury is 
always indicating to us that the country is not having enough money. So we should do with what we have and carry on in the manner that we have been doing and try to improve with the little that we have. So this issue of having provincial uh, footprint, it is still in the radar, but it is going to be a long call, of course, from our side to really meet it. It is true that uh, we have to look into improving the country general and making sure that we deepen democracy on all this as part of our exercise. I must indicate, but when it comes to what delimitations, we basically are undertaking that exercise as per the Municipal Structures Act. Uh, that is Schedule 1, I think, Part 1, uh, Section 4 of that uh, Schedule 1. It is indicating there that we have to delimit the wards for purposes of elections. But generally, at the end of the day, with also that intention, the intention also there is to make sure that the IEC can easily do its work. So we have to uh, undertake that exercise. So it is in terms of the act, it's not just because we like doing it. But of course, members have indicated that there are areas that need uh, improvement. And I think we have taken note of that. And of course, hopefully when the amendments have been approved by parliament, we will then be better empowered to do some of the things as indicated by members, including the appeals and so forth. But uh, from my side, I think that will be the response on some of the issues that have been raised. I will hand over to the COO and the officials that are supporting to give responses on issues that I haven't uh, touched on. Can we do that, Babu Ramagaza? Indeed, indeed, Chairperson. Thank you very much. Uh, there was there, there was a question by I think a member Mkalipi about the uh, the fact that there's a bill now that the committee is, is processing and where does it come in in as far as uh, our plans and all that. What I, I can indicate is that the current municipal boundary determination process obviously cannot wait and we cannot put it on hold and say we will look at it only after the bill has been finalized. But we are cognizant of the fact that the bill is currently being processed, but uh, immediately, uh, because we are part of the process anyway, and we are aware of the changes that are being proposed there, what our, our, our plans are that we will already start uh, uh, having an analysis and see how we can immediately when the bill comes through, how the board can then integrate all of that, all of that into its own processes. We are aware that there's a whole lot of changes that are likely going to have to be embarked upon by the board itself, even in terms, even structurally, we'll have to 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 structure ourselves in particular way. You have spoken about the issue of the appeals uh, uh, tribunal that has been proposed. We're going to have to 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 set, set ourselves up to to make sure that we implement all of that. But we are cognizant of, of the, the, the processes of the, of the bill itself. And then uh, I think Member Mkhalifi again asked about the findings of the VD analysis. It's, it's the kind of work that we do almost uh, between each and every local government elections. Uh, it has helped us over the years because we are, we are able to provide feedback to the IEC before they start uh, the demarcation of voting districts. So, uh, Yes, of course, there are areas where we might find that instead of a VD line going on the road, I'm just setting an example, going on a road which will make it more easier, perhaps it's going on a fence, which sometimes is not even there. So those, those we take and we, we provide to the IEC for them. Obviously, we can't tell them what to do, 
but then they would know that this, if it was to be used as a ward boundary, will create problems. So they, they would, that's the process that after we've completed our process, then we have to do with the Independent Electoral Commission. And then I think Honorable Kanyeza spoke about what the chairperson has alluded to on Emma Kazin, but mainly I'm going to talk to the fact that the municipal boundary redetermination process is done in terms of the criteria that is set in the law. So whatever proposal we may receive from anyone, it will be subjected to the criteria for demarcation. It's set up in section 24 and 25 of the Demarcation Act. So, and those factors are very specific. And that's what the board uses in when it takes its own decision. Uh, and the same for you, uh, Honorable Kanyeza spoke about the, 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 the issue of a voting district. And that talks to the, again, to the criteria for ward delimitation. There's a process of municipal boundary demarcations and the process for ward delimitation. These are separate processes. So with regards to the VD and the numbers that we use, it's, a, it's set out in the Municipal Structures Act Schedule 1, as the chairperson has indicated. And we have to implement those uh, that particular criteria. And that's why certain areas will, will end up in particular uh, places in particular wards because we have to make sure that we comply to that set of criteria from time to time. And then I think there was a question from Honorable Mpumza about uh, the classes. He was asking, what is this class for? Which has got very few proposals. In simple terms, this is where uh, there's a proposal for in a municipality to be categorized into a metro. So that's why there are few uh, uh, proposals. Uh, so that's when people are asking to for an area, particular area to be uh, categorized into a metro, which is part of the work that we do as part of the municipal demarcation process. That's why you'll find that there are very, actually very few. But I take a point that the chairperson has uh, indicated that we, we may have to share the list with the uh, committee at, at the right time to make sure that the committees are fair with all of these uh, particular issues. I think those that are uh, okay. Uh, can we then move to CRL Rights Commission? Chair Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Chairperson. Um, let me quickly go to um, Commissioner Opperman and thank you very much uh, for the issue you raise with regard to impact. Uh, indeed, in whatever we do as a commission, we seek to engender impact in communities. Otherwise, our work is not of any consequence at all. What we measure as, a, as a, an impact is the reduction of activities that initially were prevalent in communities and they are now reduced as a consequence or as a result of the work of the commission. One of which, for example, was the commercialization of religion and the abuse of people's belief system. Um, you will recall that at the time when uh, this particular issue was prevalent in society, now people are aware and they're able to make decisions in terms of which church they can go to and which one they cannot go to. And uh, of course, the reduction in terms of arrest and prosecution of those who are abusing women and children in their relig religious institution. And that is an impact itself. Um, we, we continue to show this uh, um, impact, for example, um, in our partnership with the SABC to make sure that uh, the information uh, with regard to successes and resolution uh, of conflict in different parts of the country are made known. And uh, we have a successful um, pedigree of uh, resolutions, for example, with regard to um, uh, where um, MediUP and other infrastructure built their, their businesses on top of graves of uh, people. And we're able to um, come up with a resolution to the satisfaction of both the business and the community in various parts. 
And I think um, it is this that we measure whatever we do. We have had um, an, an issue with, in Palabura with regard to initiation. And it, it, when, when we met the community to give us suggestions in terms of what needs to be done, that showed that, that the community understood the working relationship with us and, 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 the, and, and the community. Um, we have had a situation where people said to us about closed churches. And we taught um, them about the freedom of religion. And uh, it is the, uh, understanding the freedom of religion separating between the actor and the religion itself, which is intangible, that uh, if there's a problem in the religion, look at the actors, not the religion per se, because religion is intangible. And that has uh, given people understanding that you know, when there's something wrong, look at the cause of what is wrong and deal with that causality. So that's one part, which I really were happy. The issue of um, uh, for impact, it's very much at the center of what we do as a commission. The second uh, issue was raised by uh, uh, Commission uh, Honorable Mpumza with regard to resuscitation of languages. And um, we actually did a research which will be um, uh, released anytime, now, any, anytime between now and, and April is the language use. We have already identified uh, the languages that are um, um, marginalized, like Isibaka, Kilobedu, Sipulana, Isikubi. Those are identified. And once they're identified, the role is not with CRL. The role is pencil, with pencil, because pencil is a developmental um, uh, commission that deals with the development of the language. And CRL then promotes and protect. So we're working together on that. So the, 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 the report on language will be released. I think it is in that uh, which um, will satisfy some of the concerns raised by um, uh, Honorable Pumza. The, the second issue he raised was, regard, was, was with regard to the sanctity of the initiation practice, uh, considering the fact that uh, many young people are losing their lives and they continue to do, lose their lives in initiation schools, especially in the Eastern Cape. Um, we, have, uh, we are working hand in, in glove with the, uh, um, with the pro province uh, on this particular matter. And uh, we are now convening a initiation in Daba on the 25th and 26th of April to come up with the strategies and also to look at the, what the act, the, the initiation, customary initiation act of 2021, what it says and how we can live that and use it as a standard because it provides for the safety protection um, of, of the initiates and how we can use that as, a, as to uh, foreground it as, a, as an issue, which will help us to deal with the particular matter of not really allowing the practice to be um, uh, to, to, to be destroyed uh, by by this uh, careless um, illegal initiations that are taking place. Now I will request um, some members, um, especially the CFO, to deal with the under. Uh, spending um, while uh, we are seeking to be assisted to have more resources in CRL. How do we justify this? Um, CF, uh, CFO, can you take this issue? Uh, CFO. Uh, Chair, maybe let me come in first uh, before the CFO uh, to answer the question by Honorable Boza. Uh, about the Just K uh, River incident um, of people drowning while they were, they were being baptized. Now the yes. question was, uh, what is it that we we have investigated ourselves on those matters, uh, and what could be the cause of death? Um, so when the incident happened, Chair, we 
We consulted with the police in Alexandra as a commission through our communication department and also engaged with the Jobek Emergency and Alexandra Radio Station and other structures like your South African Council of Churches and uh, International Federation Council uh, uh, I mean, uh, of Christian Churches, uh, as well as um, a, a, you know, Council of Independent Churches. Uh, we were in, in, you know, in consultation to try and gather facts in terms of this matter. And the facts we came uh, to or concluded about this incident was that um, there were two views. Firstly, the incident was under the Masowe Church, which originally is suspected to be from Zimbabwe. And then the originally, uh, the, the claim was that they were conducting a baptism uh, service. But of course, um, the emergency uh, people, Jobek emergency, were also talking about not baptism, but a ritual service. But the conclusion on this matter was that it was uh, a baptism uh, that was taking place. But um, that incident became a crime scene because it was now, you know, um, with the law and, uh, you know, um, emergencies, I mean, people who enforce laws to deal with the matter to an extent of even appearing to, to court. So our um, <clears throat> role was to um, firstly sensitize the communities around Alexandra, Soweto, and other areas where there were similar incidences around the issues of being careful when they go for baptism. And it was also covered in our media statement uh, dated 6 December 2022, wherein we, uh, the chairperson of the commission, on behalf of the commission, was appealing to all the leaders and members of the cultural, religious, and linguistic communities to ensure that their rituals are done in a safe environment where the sanctity of life is always paramount. But we don't stop there. We, through public uh, education uh, department, we continuously engage with the structures or religious structures and cultural structures to gather to you know, raise awareness. Because what is important is that people must know the dangers of being ignorant when they blindly follow certain instruction from certain leaders. And we, from the constitutional point of view, raise this awareness for them to be able to know the do's and the don'ts. And that's what we continuously do. And I think uh, that's how perhaps we can answer that question. Because the issue of baptism is a doctrinal issue, which the commission may not be able to perhaps deal with, but we can only request the relevant structures that these institutions are affiliated to, to deal with so that we can be able to cap the challenges. Um, CFO will then answer the issue, uh, the question around the under expenditure. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. CFO. Thank you, thank you, Chair. Um, Chair, the, the <clears throat> savings that we, that we have reported is uh, 3 million for, for, for the year to date. The saving of three million is in mainly, mainly as in the presentation in respect of the um, saving on on the vacancies that is filled in in by acting capacity, and these vac vacancies is expected to be filled in the next financial year. So the savings will dry up very quickly once the structure is finalized, which is in a very advanced stage at the moment. I think it's in the final stages. Um, so most probably the, the, by the second quarter of next year, the vacancy should be um, advertised and filled after that. Um, and and uh, our need is for the uh, regional footprint for to, to reach into the provinces as, and into communities. And that is not something that we can do with just 3 million and from head office. We will have to have a presence in the provinces before we can really reach that mandate, part of the mandate. Um, therefore, the, the additional funds is not, um, it's not going to be offset by the, the limited savings that, that is uh, reported in the year. Uh, the, the, 
the expenditure trends is already picking up for CRL. So we will not have the savings by end of next year. So we will not be able to roll out the, the provincial presence. Chair, I trust I've... Uh, Uh, then uh, that concludes the responses. Uh, I see a hand which might be a follow up. Honorable Teza. No, thank you very much, Chair. Uh, it's a very short follow up. Follow -up. I want to uh, uh, posit some of the issues uh, raised by uh, Lance and the President of Salka. Look, uh, we've concluded, Chair, that uh, perhaps. The issues uh, as, as scientific as posited by the EFF in this committee and other political parties would have to be uh, 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 realized in an ideal society rather than a realist society. Because uh, we've posited about, about the greater amount of monies that are owed, are owed to municipality debate after debate of local government in this parliament. And uh, as Honorable Mkalipi speaks about uh, being heard or being taken seriously, I think in South Africa is the question of numbers that we'll have to speak to so that uh, no matter how scientific uh, your studies are, uh, you will have to, to, to uh, conclude that there's a problem in South Africa of what uh, Amilcar Cabral uh, speaks to of uh, 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 what he calls a cognitive dissonance. Whenever a new idea comes or any dissenting view, actually, as Mark says it, it's, uh, it's pretended to be listened to yet, uh, even in terms of uh, a, a competition of ideas, uh, <laughs> it's actually a, a pretended to be listened to or pretended to be absorbed. And as such, uh, it's killed uh, because uh, it wants to, if I can may put the example of business, uh, business will pretend under capitalist society that uh, it likes competition and, and, and kills the small businesses and, and vendors and other things in the process because in doing so, it would, in not doing so, it would, it would have to live with, 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 with dropping the prices. Uh, and so it's not taken as a, a, a competitive nature of society in terms of building local government uh, scientifically. And, and we've spoken to this chair. Secondly, chair, there's an issue there's a whole critique about uh, the white paper, which misses the tariffs, the affordable affordability of, of tariffs. And the, the, we've posited here about uh, the, the, the division of revenue formula, which assumes that municipalities will be able to, 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 to collect own revenue. Surely this has dismally failed. We've posited this year in the committee. But of course, uh, uh, Chair, like uh, uh, Honorable Mkalipi says, uh, you are... Uh, we have lost you, uh, Honorable Teza. We, we can't hear you. Uh, I, I think uh, uh, Honorable Teza was not necessarily asking a question, was uh, expressing uh, his views. And I think we have taken note of that. Actually, that's, that's uh, part of why we are engaging as the portfolio committee engaging entities that are uh, led or that are part of the executive which we are yeah. over. Yes. Yeah, are you there? I was ejected. 
Uh, I I thought we have lost you. Yes, I'm still there. I, I was ejected. I don't know. I don't know uh, because I'm here in the office. There's no problem of network. I'm in a stable area here. I don't know what did, what, what happened. Uh, nevertheless, Chair, we want municipalities that are viable. Uh, we want municipalities that are able to industrialize. Uh, we want municipalities that are able to, to concentrate on, on ensuring that the 70% the of, the, of, 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 of the of the economy that is concentrated on three uh, provinces, Gauteng, KZN, and Western Cape, that pattern changes in terms of what honorable booms are. Uh, said here. Yeah. We want to realize local government and legislation is at the center chair of, of the impediments that we are seeing now. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. As, as already indicated, I, I think we have taken note of that. Uh, possible that's the nature of government that uh, 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 all of us, the, the different uh, arms of government, they do have this responsibility to listen, take notes, and in the process, uh, formulate policies, improve, and possible come back to legislation where we need to deal with that. Uh, it looks like, honorable members, we have come to almost the end of the meeting. The wish is that uh, out of the engagements, uh, when the year comes to an end, there will be no understanding. Uh, all the targets would be achieved and ultimately we would be able to account for all the resources that have been allocated. I think the indications for now from the three entities are positive in terms of the quarter. Uh, I see, uh, oh, Councillor Flora Wortman from Salga. Thank you, thank you, uh, Chairperson, and apologies for interjecting. I just yes. wanted to put a request forward before the chairperson uh, 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 um, say the last words before we close. And mm. that is just a request that, uh, um, and apologies that the president left for another meeting. And we would like to request that even before we deal with the, the meeting we were referring to earlier, uh, under one roof, uh, the president and myself, we discussed and we thought maybe we must ask from this sitting. And it was like uh, Honorable Teza was listening to us when we said, you know, we are assisting municipalities and we want to see all that Council uh, Honorable Teza indicated just now to see the municipality that is functioning and all that and, uh, and that. So we are requesting that we are allowed an open session with the committee members. Um, the president indicated one or two days, but I think one day will suffice because we know what the challenges are. I'm just putting the request forward uh, and the chairperson will look into it and maybe we can uh, talk about it later. Thank you very much. No, thank you very much. Uh... I, I think we are taking note of that. Uh, we this this has been repeatedly raised, but uh, like uh, everybody says, this item might have been uh, moved away from. It cannot be moved away if we listened uh, carefully on the state of the nation address and by implication departments expected to come up with, uh, especially uh, a COCTA, to come up with, uh, and, and national treasury, to come up with something that guides as to 
how do we turn around the situation? We can't just keep on talking about 66 municipalities interventions when they do not yield what is expected. What kind of action should we take? I think uh, we, we, we're taking note of the, that uh, approach from Salga and uh, I'm sure we will look at it and, uh, and come up with a clear proposal as to how do we deal with this. And I think everybody is focusing on this. How do we turn around? We can't just uh, describe municipalities to be dysfunctional and uh, our actions do not impact positively on them. I think we, we need to get back to some drawing board. Uh, of course, like I'm saying, led by the executive, who demand that as people who are doing oversight, uh, as pronounced by the president, that we must need to firm up our hand in dealing with this uh, situation. Because local uh, municipalities are very close to the people. And uh, so I think we are taking note of that. But I was concluding to say the, uh, the target or the performance for quarter three is positive and would like that it should remain like that until the end of the year. And we will not observe any under expenditure, any non achievement of targets that have been set that would have served a purpose, uh, this kind of session, where we meet to look at the quarterly performance and uh, identify gaps. Then the ball now falls into the court of the entities to say, go close whatever gaps and achieve what you normally achieve. And we normally uh, uh, see it through the audit outcomes. Otherwise, thank you very much. Uh, the session is adjourned. Thank you. Thank you, Chair.